Okay, I think we are ready to start. Uh, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the fifth and final day of the Destiny Second School on the topic Smart Data Processing and Systems of Deep Insight. Today, we have seven interesting presentations, starting with Mr. George Millis, Director and Innovation Manager of FOEBE Research and Innovation. He's going to present the topic Water Analytics Digital Twin. Mr. George, when you are ready, you can start. Okay, good morning, guys. Uh, nice to see you. It's very early in the morning, so I, I know. I hope you did have the time to get your coffee. And uh, I'm George, George Milis. I uh, represent here Phoebe Research and Innovation uh, Limited. And uh, you will spend the next uh, 40 minutes uh, with me uh, discussing the topic of water analytics. So if you're uh, into that. Uh, I would like also to have a little bit of uh, interaction with you, since I think that uh, it's very important uh, to communicate the concepts. We don't need to go into the details of everything, but my goal today is to attract your interest in uh, these topics, which have to do with uh, data analysis. In, in various domains, here we're gonna speak about the water uh, domain. So first of all, uh, Phoebe, as, uh, I'll give you an inspiration as well. So Phoebe started in 2016. Uh, it's an, a small company with 10 employees here in Cyprus. We were all people uh, comprising Phoebe, uh, actually researchers that came out of the only research uh, path and we are doing commercialization of uh, the work uh, of the research intellectual property. And up to now, we managed to have quite uh, good uh, funding rates and uh, we are turning, we managed to turn uh, some of the work of the research work into products as we will see in the next uh, slides. So in this uh, course, I call it a course, is uh, I will read, you will learn about water networks or systems, if you prefer, the challenges faced with regards to their hydraulics and quality dynamics, we will see what this uh, means, and the technological tools we have, or we can build, or you can build in the near future, which help us support the operators of the system to achieve better performance. Again, this better performance means some things we will see. And uh, by the end of this uh, 40 minutes uh, course lecture, you will um, know what water network systems mean. Mainly we are focusing on the water distribution, drinking water distribution uh, systems. You will be able to recognize the challenges related to the operation of the water system in terms of hydraulics and quality, as I mentioned earlier. You will be able to define some ICT tools, which you will learn, and uh, you can use to facilitate better performance of the water systems. You will be able to acknowledge the usefulness of the tools and their potential impact to the work of the system operators. You will know about the existence of uh, analytics platforms, which in the future you will contribute to, and you will understand how to contribute as whatever your background is, engineers, scientists, ICT professionals, et cetera, in these uh, domains or in other domains related to the data science. So uh, as I said, if you're into that, uh, otherwise I will uh, skip it. Um, if uh, anyone wants to, do, to share with us, what comes to your mind when you hear water networks? I'll give 10 seconds for reaction. Don't be shy, it's, uh, I mean, it's a free discussion and uh, there is no wrong answers here. In my view, water networks is a system that gives the opportunity to the households to have water. Uh, to, yeah. you know, uh, so it's a, it's a system then? That... That yes. brings water to our house, yes? Mm -hmm. For smart Excellent. waters is uh, yeah, management. Then the thing is, uh, what is now smart? 
uh, waters. Any, any, anyone else uh, wants to share what, what comes to your mind with water networks, water systems? Oh, so, so smart, uh, Stelio, I know what is a smart water system now? Smart water system, in my opinion, is the management of this network. Yeah, so uh, with the management of these networks, they become what we call smart. Trust me, they are not smart. Uh, I, want, uh, I don't know if this is good or bad, but we are using in general in our domain this uh, word in exaggeration. So uh, smart buildings, smart water systems, smart X, smart Y. They are not really smart. If you want, we can go into that, but uh, it's not the scope of this presentation. They are actually doing something more than just bringing us water. They, they have some uh, communication infrastructure and they do some uh, processing of, uh, the, of the information in order to help the operators make decisions. They don't make decisions themselves uh, up to today. And uh, now I want to give you the real uh, picture. I don't know if you, this disturbs your view. Uh, this is a, a water system, okay? It's a real one. And uh, I wanted to give you the, the, this uh, view of uh, what a real water system diagram uh, looks like, not just uh, diagrams on uh, the computer. This is uh, the water system in Paphos. Okay, I got it from a, a real competition for uh, offers to build the smartness of this water system. You see, these are the areas on the top uh, right. It's Anarita. It's an area in Paphos. We have Mesa Horio on the left, Silo. It's another area, Vasudi, Vasiliko, Yeroskipu, Pirosvestiki. So these are geographic locations, areas in uh, in Paphos. It's a, a city um, in Cyprus with around 50,000 inhabitants, a little bit less. And uh, you see the signs we are using in order to uh, design this water system. You see these blue cylinders, they are tanks. It's a tank, it's a, a box with uh, water inside. And this is how the water is stored in uh, various locations before it arrives to our homes. And uh, the purple ones uh, is just a tank again, with uh, it's not ready. Uh, it, it was a legend for this uh, diagram. Then you see this circle with the arrows. Uh, at Vasiliko, there is one. At Anarita on the top right, it's a pump station. A pump is a, a device, a, 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 yes, a, it's a, a machine that uh, pushes the water. If there is not enough pressure to take the water from one side to another, from one location to another, we are using a pump. It pushes the water. Then we have at uh, down at Piros Vestigi and uh, up at Anarita, we have boreholes. Boreholes are a, a source of water. We dig into the, the earth and we find water and we bring it up in order to use it for uh, drinking or from, uh, for the agriculture. And uh, this orange box says it is chlorine control panel. Chlorine is a, uh, it's an entity we are putting, it's a chemical, you know what chlorine is, but we use chlorine, we put it in the water because it reacts with some organic agents in the water and it actually kills bacteria and uh, several other things, not everything, unfortunately. And uh, this uh, chlorine helps us control the quality of the water. It's one of the things we are doing to control the quality of the water. And you also see these arrows. The, the red ones are actually input arrows to the tanks. It's the water coming from rivers, lakes, dams, which we have in uh, Cyprus and in any other uh, country in order to collect water and uh, bring it to, the, to our homes. Uh, the yellow arrows uh, is uh, the consumption so from those tanks, there are pipes 
small or bigger pipes which bring the water home. This is exactly how the, the whole thing works. It's tanks which are nodes somewhere with water and there is a whole system with machines and everything that brings it uh, to us. And let me move. I don't know why it doesn't move. Ah, okay. And uh, this is the real thing now. You saw the diagram. These are the tanks. And you see all these pipes that are, you see in real life, this is how it uh, looks. It's uh, sometimes it's uh, old things that after a few years, they have to be uh, replaced, et cetera. But this is it. You see these blue pipes, they are actually pumping water, bringing it in the tanks, outside the tanks. You see here, real tanks, they are big boxes with uh, water. And there is also a pumping station here. So because the pressure is not enough, uh, the, the height difference is not enough to bring the water from uh, the tanks to the consumers, they are using a pump here as well. And here you see the water inputs. This is water coming from the, from the rivers or from uh, the dams and uh, they are controlled by a float control valve. Valve is a device again, a, a thing that we have in order to control uh, the, the rate of uh, the water coming in or out. Here it's inputs of water to the tanks. And here is a pumping station. It's a whole room with um, the hydraulics required in order to push the water to the consumers to take it from the tank and push it. It needs also some electrical things and some mechanical things in order to work. And here are the water meters in order to know how much, you know the water meters that we have at home. Somebody comes and takes a measurement or there is an automatic way of sending the measurement. And uh, this way we know that uh, the flow of the water was X, Y, Z. This is on the left how it looks like uh, from a close. It's actually similar to what we have at home, but here it measures the flow of the water that goes in or out of, uh, of a tank. We, know, we want to know the consumption of uh, the water. And here is a room where we have the electronics things and the automation things. All these pumps and the chlorine control we mentioned earlier, and uh, the flows, the measurements from the sense from the meters, we want to see them uh, remotely. All these things come with some wires to this control station. It's in distributed here. It's in, in a specific location, and it has PLCs. I don't. I, I will not go into details for that. It's programmable uh, programmable logic controllers, which uh, they program. Uh, the information to come to us in the control center, or they program the action we are doing on the uh, on the water system, and this is the control center where uh, these electronics we saw earlier, these uh, PLCs, send the information, and then we have screens around with uh, different ways of uh, presenting and different granularity, different kind of details we want to see with diagrams and everything. So it takes some years of uh, study in order to be able to understand these uh, things. Not me, I'm uh, also me, I'm, I'm not in position to understand the details in these diagrams. And because uh, the water operators, water system operators are actually experienced engineers or uh, professionals that uh, are able to read, understand, and make decisions to operate the, the water system. Uh, in the end, a uh, water system, like uh, Stelios mentioned at the beginning, is uh, an effort of, uh, of some authority, some water utility to bring water to our home or for agriculture clean and safe if it's uh, for drinking and uh, clean enough for uh, the agriculture, uh, of course. And we, of course, don't want to pay much for that. So the lower the cost, the better, the cleaner the water, the better. What we want to do when we control, when we monitor, we put these meters and we measure things 
and we want to change things, the valves, the pumps, how they work. Uh, actually, we want to reduce the event detection and response time. So if there is something wrong, if there is something wrong with the quality of the water, or if there is a leakage and we are losing water through some uh, holes, uh, we want to know early enough. If uh, it takes time, we spend money and we don't uh, satisfy the demand of our, our consumers. So we want to be able to detect such events in time and respond in time. Respond means uh, controlling, doing something to fix the, the, any damage. And this leads also to reducing the risk of health issues. So if there are uh, contaminations in the water, some pathogens, we want to know in order to remove them or stop the consumption of the water because people go to hospital then. And uh, it's a big uh, risk for our lives as well. And uh, by, by detecting things early, we're reducing also the maintenance cost. And uh, we reduce the liability. If there is an insurance company paying for the operation of the water and something ha happens, uh, there is cost for the insurance company as well. We want to improve the personnel workload profile. So if, uh, if we want people to go every day under the rain and under the sun to find the problems in the water system, it's a difficult job. But if we have some automatic way of receiving information and knowing exactly where uh, uh, damage is, an event occurred, then we improve the personnel profile uh, workload. And uh, we satisfy the consumers and we give them comfort to trust the utility. And of course, the European Union, thankfully, is somebody that gives directives to all uh, European Union countries to provide clean and safe water uh, to the consumers. Um, as I respond to these uh, challenges, uh, in Phoebe, in collaboration with the uh, Kios Research Center of the uh, University of Cyprus, uh, we developed water analytics. This is a tool, uh, an ICT tool, as I mentioned at the beginning, which will help us do some, uh, address some of these challenges. This is actually, it looks like this on the front end. This is a tool that the water operators uh, typically use, not that, that much in Cyprus, uh, in other countries they're using it more. It's the EPA net tool. Doesn't matter if you don't remember, it's just, I want you to keep that there is a tool somewhere that uh, helps the water operators see what happens in their water system. And here, we, as you will see in a minute that we are developing smart algorithms, smart apps, as we call them. They are not smart, they are just helping. They are doing something more than uh, just existing and they are helping the system operators. And this tool is actually a set of applications like the ones we have on our uh, mobile devices. Now, it's, instead of our mobile devices, they are in another tool, this uh, water analytics tool. And they help us do things we will see later. And it also has a desktop part, which is what the operators see in those screens we saw earlier. They, they visualize things on, the, on these big screens and it acts as a digital water twin. This is a keyword here. What do we mean by digital water twin? Anybody? If you want to test. Yes, Sergio? A digital twin is a, a digital representation of a physical entity. In this case, the water network. Excellent. It's a, it's a digital representation. So in the end, uh, we take the measurements, we, we measure things. We measure flow in the water system. We measure the pressure which is uh, related to the height of uh, the water. We measure uh, many different parameters, uh, the chlorine in the water, and uh, we model the network as we saw earlier in those big screens. We have then design of the network and we model it, we will see in a minute, 
and uh, we it's the way to test things if i want to know what will happen if i open that uh, valve in full uh, range I, I i cannot do it in a real system i cannot go and test things i i have to know before i do something so the way to know is nowadays with the so-called digital twins we have a, a digital representation a, a virtual thing on the computer that more or less it uh, acts as the real water system and doing that we can test things and with enough accuracy we will be able to know uh, what uh, the real system how the real system will um, behave if we do that thing we did on the digital uh, alternative uh, so this is a, a digital water twin what we are presenting now and in order to manage the data this time series these uh, values every every minute or sometimes every second we have uh, data coming from the different places in the water system in uh, in, in a database at the control center and we need to store this data we need to be able to process the data we need to be able to synchronize what the operators uh, see in their uh, applications and for this we are using what we call uh, an integrated backend iot platform iot is internet of things uh, if you're not familiar with the word just uh, consider it as a, a network of devices and processing power to make sense of the data uh, and this platform actually takes care of storing the data uh, building the models uh, orchestrating how the applications work integrating the applications we will see etc and uh, okay i will not go into details here uh, in a, in the big picture you have on the top the water system SCADA, SCADA, SCADA. It's system and supervisory control and data acquisition. It's everywhere. So in water systems, in electricity grids, in transportation networks, this is the system that measures things, brings close to us and helps us react to, the, to what we read. And the water analytics is actually helping to manage the data from uh, the SCADA, and it can also connect to, to applications in order to run what if scenarios and measure the impact, as we mentioned earlier. What if I open that valve? What if I put a sensor measure, a emitter measuring something there? And in the end, with this uh, digital twin and the analytics, instead of having five, six, meters in those tanks measuring, we can actually use mathematical models of the network in order to estimate the values, the flows, the pressures in every, uh, in every location. And uh, we built thousands of virtual meters, virtual sensors. And having this information, we process the information and we make decisions. I already mentioned that uh, water analytics is built on top of uh, this EPA net uh, software. It's an open source uh, thing. You will have this information uh, after this uh, presentation. Here is how it looks. Uh, this is a water network. We saw it in, uh, in a more real representation earlier. This is how it looks in a, in a, in a modeling uh, uh, visualization. We don't need to know more. It's just the nodes, the tanks, and the points and the lines that connect these uh, nodes. It depends what we want to do. And uh, here is another representation which shows some information about the, the nodes, the elevation of the water, the flows and everything. Here is a geographical thing. We can see a geographical representation of the area. Then we can have sensors, meters, things that we measure. You see here in the tool, you can have many kinds of uh, meters integrated measuring on the junctions on the pipes on the tanks flows pressures chlorine concentration etc and we also have the smart water apps as we call them 
and it's a list here, each one of these is doing something to help the, the operator, the one that sits in front of those screens we saw earlier. And this is the list of uh, applications we have uh, developed so far. We expect you as the next uh, engineers in the field and then next professionals to build more and come to us uh, to collaborate and put it in the real uh, systems. It's a model reduction, hydraulic state estimation, water quality sensor placement. We will see few of them now. I will skip this. This is another way of representing. I don't want you to look at the details uh, here. So if we want to study how a water system works, we can model it on the paper with uh, notations, mathematical notations. So on the top left, it's some representation of uh, the water system. WundiN is the water and distribution network. We have the sensors estimating some values, as I mentioned, and controlling something through some actuation devices. On the bottom left, we have another representation, a representation of the tank, of a, a single tank with some values we want to measure, we want to know is uh, on the top right. And then also the mathematical formulas that describe how the water goes, how, how is the water moving through a pipe. There is some rate of movement there is some mathematical representation of this uh, physical phenomenon. Let's see a few of, the, of these apps now. One is what we call hydraulic state estimation. In water systems, hydraulic is the, the parameters that uh, relate to how the, the system works and how it uh, moves the water around. Uh, hydro is the water. And uh, state estimation, what is a state? A state of the system is what we decide that if we know, we know exactly how the system works. So a state of a system is some knowledge, which if we have, we can describe the system as if we know every step of its uh, operation. So a state in the water system for the hydraulic part is actually if we know the flow of the water and the pressure of the water in every single node junction. So wherever there is a change in uh, the flows of the water, in the, in, the, in the directions of the water, we want to know the pressure. The pressure is what causes the water to move. The pressure difference from one point to another causes the water to move from the higher pressure to the lower pressure. And this is, if we know this state, it means we, we describe the whole system. And um, the question now is, uh, we want to measure the state and we want to have meters to measure the flow and pressure uh, at different uh, locations. Uh, however, we don't have always uh, meters, sensors in every single node and in every single pipe in the water system. We are using the models we showed earlier. So we are building a, a, a design of the network. We are writing the equations in order to, uh, to uh, describe how the water moves if we have these uh, measures we take and we try to estimate. So if I know these few flows and pressures in the water system and I know that the, the operation of uh, the system, I describe it using these mathematical formulas. What would be the pressures and flows in all other nodes in order for this, what I, I, I see here to be consistent? So the, my mathematical model and the measurements I get help me to estimate the values in other uh, places of the network. Of course, I cannot know accurately, 100% accurately. Even the measurements are not 100% the real uh, values of what I measure. It's uh, an estimation. And the better the models, the better the estimation uh, is. And uh, by measuring things, it helps us also improve the models. So this is a little bit smarter. The models are improved in time 
by using the data that uh, we get from the water system. All these things are uh, a degree on their own. So don't worry if you don't understand the details, just take the big uh, message here that we can estimate the values in the, in the uh, flows and the pressures of the water system by modeling them. And here is a, an example of this uh, execution here. Uh, we didn't know the values in every point, but the system helped us to uh, calculate the values in every single point in the network. And some uh, graphical representation. As I told you, only the experienced people can uh, read this and you can become these experienced people or you can become the people that design these uh, tools for them. And then it's a similar thing, the quality state estimation. So we want to know the quality of the water in every single point, if possible. Quality, we don't measure actually the quality. What we can measure is if I, if I put X amount of chlorine somewhere, I know that uh, it reacts to some uh, pathogens and organic agents. So if on the other end, I measure zero, chlorine, I put 100 and I measure zero, I know that the 100 reacted with some pathogens. And this means that my quality is not uh, good for that uh, part of the water. So by measuring, it's one way of uh, controlling the, of uh, measuring the quality by using what uh, chlorine reacts to. So uh, measuring the chlorine input and chlorine output I have an estimation of the quality, but again, I cannot have um, uh, chlorine concentration measurements in every single point of the network. I model the, the flow of the water again. I use also the estimation of the flows and the pressures from the previous uh, algorithm we saw. And I try to estimate if I put this amount of chlorine in this tank we saw earlier here, and I know how the water moves because I know all the things about my pipes. I know their uh, diameter. I know their uh, length and everything. I can mathematically model the, the moving of the water around in the network. So I estimate what would be the concentration of chlorine in, a, in every node. And of course, if there is a difference, then I go to detection of uh, chloride of uh, quality problems and this is again how it looks uh, in a system another thing now model reduction this is an, again a big uh, topic uh, if i have a very complex model mathematically or visually a very complex thing for the water network but I don't mind about the details. So why, why should I use a very complex thing in order to estimate the, the, the pressures and the flows in five central locations in uh, the network? What I can do, I'm using again mathematical tools in order to reduce this model. Reducing means making it less complex and uh, allowing me to understand it better and uh, get the information better. Always when I reduce a model, when I make it simpler, I am losing something of uh, the information. So the complex model is actually a more accurate representation and better digital twin of uh, the water system. Uh, but uh, when I reduce it, I'm losing something of the, of the accuracy. However, depending on the reason why I need this simpler model, I may not mind. I don't mind if I'm losing uh, X, uh, X percentage of accuracy because it will not make a difference in the action then I will uh, take on the system. So it's better if I am able to do these calculations and uh, know something about my network instead of going to the complex thing, not being able to get any knowledge so uh, it's always in balance. Uh, depends always as engineers, 
If you are genius, you will know that it depends always what you want to achieve and you have to find the, uh, the appropriate tools for that. And the criteria here for the reduction of the model is I want to maintain the demands, the distribution demands. So I don't want to uh, destroy uh, my knowledge about the demands, the, the pipe characteristics, the diameters, the lengths, et cetera, and the elevation of the water. I will not go into details. Then sensor placement, either pressure or flow or whatever kind of sensor placement. Again, using the mathematical model of the network I, I, and the knowledge I have about how the water moves inside and how the concentration of chlorine, et cetera, moves. Uh, I'm asking the question, where, if I have only five sensors now, five flow meters, where should I put these five flow meters in order to be able to estimate better the values in all other places in the network? Or where should I put these six chlorine concentration meters sensors in order to estimate better the, uh, and observe my whole system about uh, the quality and uh, reduce the cost of uh, lives then if something happens. So this algorithm answers this question. It tells you where to put the sensors in order, if you have fewer than uh, you, uh, you need, in order to uh, achieve the maximum of what you want. And it gives you again a model. The same, the same concept is for the quality sensor placement. I want to attract your attention to these uh, things. Uh, pressure control for leakage detect, detect, reduction. If I control the pressure and I manage to reduce the pressures in a network by keeping the performance, so serving the demand of the consumers and uh, achieving what the system would achieve, but with less pressures, it, uh, it is, uh, we calculate that the, the, the loss of the water is also reduced. So the leakages are also reduced. So this is another thing we are doing. I will skip that because of the time. It's a pipe risk estimation, the risk of pipes breaking in the next uh, uh, years or uh, months. And all these things, apart from the water analytics as uh, Phoebe, we are developing also web tools that uh, help the operators have visualization of, uh, of what happens in their network, manage the network, the, their meters, they are able to view the things and they have reports of water loss, so these are important information for the water operators and they can only be achieved if we have this uh, uh, smart ICT system on top of the water network. Alarms, important thing. We want to help the operators know if something goes wrong. And all these alarms are brought to us uh, by the models we saw earlier, the estimations. And of course, this was a work of uh, some uh, people from universities, from companies, and uh, we got also, always we need money to do th things. We got it from the commission and the Cyprus government. And uh, here we are in Aglanja for whoever, and the information contact details for whoever wants to know more. Thank you for your time. I don't know if we have a couple of minutes for uh, questions since we started five minutes uh, later, yes, Stelio? Yes, it's okay. <clears throat> we'll have time for questions. If All anybody right. has to ask something. I, actually, I, I, I could spend more time uh, in things if you want me to go back, if we have uh, 10. Uh, yeah, well, we don't have yeah. the time to go All back, right. but okay. we can't for any questions. And uh, until you get uh, warm for questions, I will mention that uh, my goal today, as I said at the beginning, is to attract your interest in uh, this uh, work. So now you're lucky because nowadays we have the processing power, we have the way to measure things and bring it to, to the computers somewhere. And uh, we can think of uh, 
uh, algorithms, design uh, ways of achieving something. So uh, at the beginning, people were uh, measuring things and uh, they didn't know how to estimate the values in different parts. And then somebody at some point in time thought that uh, if, I, if I have a mathematical formulation of this, I can tell you because the water floats is a physical process. And I can, if I know everything that affects this physical process, I can tell you what the value should be there. Of course, I cannot know for sure. I can estimate. This is why we call it estimation. And in the platforms where we represent these graphical um, values, uh, we have the real measurements and we have the virtual measurements. It's uh, what we estimate through the mathematics. And uh, yeah, digital twins are uh, becoming a hot topic everywhere. So uh, if you're studying in these uh, fields, uh, there is uh, a future. And uh, I don't know for every country, but uh, I guess in, this, uh, in Cyprus it's true and in, uh, in many other European countries, these jobs are, uh, uh, how to say, there is place, there is demand for uh, people uh, able to do these things in uh, Europe now and in the US. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. George, for your very interesting presentation. I was attracted by your work. Uh, thank you very much for, for showing it. Uh, I'm sure our attendees are attracted as well. Uh, now we can move to the next presenter, which is again from Foebe Research Innovation, is Mr. Dimitrianos Gavril. Uh, he's going to uh, present the Pandora Seal, an AI-based decision support tool for the selection of non-pharmaceutical interventions during the pandemics. Hello. Uh, hope everyone's doing well. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Can't you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hello again. My name is uh, Dimitrianos Gavril. I'm a PhD student in physics and I work as a data scientist at Phoebe Research and Innovation. Uh, today, my presentation is about uh, an AI based decision support tool uh, for the selection of the non pharmaceutical. Uh, interventions during pandemics. Uh, this tool is incorporated in uh, Pandora Seal platform. So uh, we start off by an introduction into epidemiological models and data availability. And next we will define uh, the and formulate uh, our challenge and then provide uh, the solution methodology that we have used to tackle this uh, challenge. Uh, also later, uh, we are uh, gonna uh, look into Cyprus as a case study and draw some uh, overall conclusions. Um, so uh, we start off, uh, with the uh, main goal uh, of uh, uh, this uh, tool, um, which is to provide a solution that would help decision makers uh, to select and implement the most efficient responses to pandemics. This can be uh, done uh, with uh, two uh, steps. First, uh, to provide tool so that we can for forecast the future of the pandemic state. And second, uh, to investigate different what if scenarios and find the appropriate uh, responses. As we will show later, a uh, data driven machine learning approach can be a powerful uh, tool for epidemiological models. 
Um, so uh, now uh, let's look at the proposed models that have been developed in literature and in order to uh, predict how the COVID-19 pandemic spreads. This can be uh, uh, categorized into uh, three, uh, group, uh, three groups. Here, uh, first is the compartmental models, uh, the network models, and the aging-based models. And our focus will be simulating um, on simulating the effects of the non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions. Sorry, why this so automatically? And for short, NPIs, and this will help uh, the decision makers makers to take the appropriate uh, responses. Uh, uh, let's start off with compartmental models. Um, as for example, the serial model, the well-known serial model, as you can see here in this picture. Uh, this model describes the overall um, global transmission dynamics uh, within a population as a system of uh, differential equations in continuous time. And depending on the uh, disease characteristics, uh, compartmented and flow patterns between them can be uh, refined. Uh, usually these models uh, can be extended with information on the MPIs by modifying uh, the transmission rates, uh, which is the beta, as you can see here. However, these models have some limitations. They are uh, uh, they have a homogeneity uh, between the population. That means that each individual has the same percentage to transmit the disease. And the uh, second limitation is that uh, the NPIs are not represented uh, directly, but uh, they uh, approximate it as, uh, as we said before, as changes in transmission rates. Uh, so we have also the network models where uh, they represent contact patterns, taking into account uh, geographics, demographics, and social factors. Um, there are several studies on adaptive networks uh, that aim to model the dynamics of social links, such as frequency, intensity, locality, and so on, and find the long-term impacts on epidemics. So also these uh, models have uh, some limitations. Um, First, they require a huge amount of data that is, uh, uh, is not easily accessible. And uh, their structure uh, becomes easily very complicated. And as a third uh, a group of models, of epidemiological models, we have the aging-based models, which uh, describe the overall dynamics of infection uh, as a result of events of a single individual. Uh, that, uh, that is a very detailed process. Uh, again, as with uh, uh, network models, we have, uh, they require a lot of data, a lot of uh, limited access data. It's difficult to find. And also they uh, require uh, huge computating resources and a lot of uh, uh, paralyzation and sophisticated algorithms. Um, so now let's look at the available data sources. Uh, as we will show later, we will need uh, these uh, sources for our uh, <clears throat> for our project here. Uh, first, the number of uh, confirmed cases of COVID nineteen can be found in uh, coronavirus uh, COVID-19 global cases uh, of the center, by the Center of uh, System Science and Engineering at Jobs Hawking University. Uh, for the vaccinations, uh, you can find data in our world in data, uh, we, where you can find all the uh, data for the first, second, and third dose of uh, vaccination. 
and also the non-pharmacological uh, interventions, uh, the NPIs, can be found in the Oxford COVID-19 government response tracker, which is basically a representation of NPIs uh, characterized by their type and their stringency level. Um, here, uh, we can see uh, an example of the NPI uh, data. Um, so let's look uh, here on the uh, left side. Uh, we have the different group categories that uh, uh, NPIs are uh, categorized into. And on the, on the right side here on the table, we can see uh, the different strictness uh, level of each category. Now let's uh, look at an example for the fourth NPI category, which is restriction gatherings. Here at level zero, uh, we have uh, no measures. Um, at level one, we have restrictions on very large uh, gatherings uh, above 1,000 people. On level two, uh, we have uh, restrictions on gatherings between 100 and 1,000, and on level three, uh, and so on, on level four. Uh, so uh, let's uh, move to, uh, now, what is the challenge? The challenge is to predict the uh, future pandemic state, given a pair of contexts and actions. Usually, the contexts are uh, the confirmed cases and vaccinations and the actions are the different uh, MPIs. So uh, this uh, model has to obey some requirements. Uh, it has to use of uh, open data based on valid assumptions, uh, of course, be accurate as possible. And uh, also it has to be raw use low computational resources in order to evaluate uh, different what-if scenarios. And uh, finally, construct uh, some meaningful intervals. Some uh, answer has to provide some uncertainty. So uh, machine learning can be used uh, to co construct such a model. And um, especially, um, and in particular, recurrent uh, neural networks um, can be an approach uh, uh, for this uh, model. But first, uh, let's look into the XPRIZE uh, pandemic response challenge, uh, which is a global competition uh, launched by XPRIZE and Cognizant. Um, there are uh, uh, 104 teams uh, have taken part into these competitions from 28 countries all over the world. And the winner team was Valencia AI for COVID-19. And the uh, main goal of this uh, challenge was to create an AI, an evolutionary AI model uh, to help uh, reopen the world's economies and uh, societies safer and fast, faster after the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. It consisted to, of recreating an, uh, a recurrent neural network model uh, in order to uh, predict the future pandemic state and prescribe uh, NPIs. So uh, what is exactly a recurrent uh, neural network? Uh, it's basically a neural network with loops, allowing information to be passed uh, from one step to another, as uh, we can see here on this picture. It can be thought of multiple copies of the same network, each passing a message to the successor. Now, uh, LST, a special kind of uh, an RNN uh, model is the long short-term memory network, uh, for short LSTM, which is uh, this cell, as you can see here, and is capable of learning long-term dependencies uh, that will be uh, useful in our case. So now, <clears throat> what is the Pandora seal idea? Uh, we consider how COVID-19 evolved in multiple countries under different APIs, 
then we train a machine learning model uh, using those data uh, to learn to predict how uh, the future cases um, will um, form under different MPIs. We also learn the uncertainties uh, of that model, and then uh, we apply the model, this model, to forecast the evolution of COVID-19 cases in Cyprus and evaluate uh, the impact of different APIs. Uh, so uh, our predictor model design is heavily based on cognizant research and the winning team of the EX Prize uh, challenge. Uh, for each uh, country, for a given country, uh, we consider this uh, minimal epidemiological model, where Xn is the, the number of new cases by day n, and Rn here is the factor to be predicted. These will be constructed uh, from daily cases uh, of each country. However, um, the data is usually noisy and unreliable, so we form a smooth targets here with a Zn, which is basically a moving averages of uh, new cases. Uh, in the follow discussion, we will use uh, um, k equal to seven in this equation here. Uh, that means that we are smoothing over the preceding week. Um, <clears throat> So to capture the effects of the population size and immunity, immunity and vaccination, we add this additional uh, factor here that scales <clears throat> uh, the predictions by the proportion of population that could possibly transmit the disease. So P here is the population size, W1, 2, and 3 are weight factors. And VN and UN are the total uh, number of people vaccinated uh, with the first and second dose by the day N. Um, so CN here is the total number of recorded cases uh, by day N. So by rearranging this equation here, we can derive uh, the predicted HN. Uh, that can be recovered uh, by calculating this uh, training factor Rn. Now, um, we move on to the trainable uh, function Rn. Uh, it should be a, fu a function of two things. One, the uh, NPI's resistiveness uh, values for the past 21 days. Uh, and second, the underlying state, of course, of the pandemic uh, for the uh, past uh, three weeks. This uh, function can be uh, decomposed with respect to its input um, so that uh, we can um, set g of n of a n uh, to be monotonic with respect to each NPI. And that means that uh, if we increase the stringency of NPI, it will increase uh, their effectiveness. And also uh, with this decomposition, we can implement two uh, recurrent neural network, two LSTM uh, models to train the model. Uh, see, uh, we can see here uh, at this picture, the model architecture here, we have uh, the context inputs. So it's the first uh, LSTM model, the architecture uh, model. And uh, down here, we can see uh, how the action input uh, can be implemented as uh, a second LSTM model. So we join these two models uh, with, a, with a lambda layer, uh, and that will be our uh, trainable function. So um, data before uh, the starting day of the pandemic in each country were removed as those are, ir are irrelevant. Uh, also, the last 14 days of data are withheld for testing. Uh, the whole data is uh, randomly split between 19% uh, for training and 10% for validation. Uh, uh, now about the predictions, we perform uh, the known rollout predictions, 
which are predictions far into the future. Uh, and this is done by auto-regressively uh, feeding the prediction, the one-day prediction uh, from here back into the model. So uh, we can predict uh, far into uh, the future uh, without the need of uh, knowing any uh, uh, data uh, during the uh, prediction period. Um, now, uh, about uh, how we model the uncertainty uh, of these models that uh, I have described in predictions. Um, we can uh, perform this by combining a Bayesian model uh, with it, but uh, usually this is harder to set up and train. So uh, we switch to a recent alternative, uh, the Rio method. Rio stands for uh, residuals, input and output kernels. So this is a separate model uh, that is trained to estimate the uncertainty in point prediction models. A Gaussian uh, process is fit to the residual errors in the training set. And the uh, input and output kernel of the, the Rio uh, the Rio method uh, utilizes both the input and output of the training model. So uh, we use information when it's most uh, reliable. Uh, further advantages of this method is that it also improves the point prediction of the original model by correcting them uh, towards the mean. And it can be applied to any machine uh, learning model uh, without any retraining or modification into the actual model. Um, so here, uh, this picture, uh, we can see the architecture of this uh, certainty model that we have used. So uh, in our case, uh, as input uh, kernel of Rio here with the uh, red box uh, is the hidden state is the concatenation of the hidden states of the two LSTM uh, models that we have seen before, but before the lambda layer. As an output uh, kernel of Rio, we have used the origin the residuals of the original predictions. Um, so then using a stochastic uh, variational Gaussian process uh, with 15 dozen points and two RBF kernels, uh, we um, provide uh, the Rio model provides a Gaussian distribution uh, that is calibrated uh, for the calibrated uh, predictions. So uh, this uh, uh, method can um, return both uh, the prediction and the uncertainty. But how actually do, do we uh, find these predictions? Uh, it's simple. We calculate the mean uh, for each rollout uh, by instead, by uh, get a, we get a sample from this Gaussian distribution returned by Rio. And this sample is fed uh, back into the model in order to make a prediction. Now, as for the uncertainty, uh, we, we provide 50 uh, sample of Monte Carlo rollouts, and we get the upper and lower quartile um, for each uh, forecasting day. Now, uh, let's look at the case study. Uh, we are focused, uh, we're, our main focus will be on Cyprus. Uh, for our training model, uh, we have used uh, historical data of uh, European countries, except Cyprus, uh, that is 38 countries, until the 14th of December 2021. Uh, the last training day is uh, November 30, and the first 40 days of December, so with Kelford testing, as uh, we have mentioned before. Uh, we uh, make three independent runs to choose the best model. And this, uh, uh, and we have choose the best one based on the complementary performing metric, the normalized case mean absolute error. Uh, this is the mean absolute error 
uh, of new cases over the 14 test period time and uh, normalized by the number of true cases. Uh, the evaluation of the model uh, is, uh, um, is executed uh, by uh, taking 100 random periods of uh, 14 days and comparing it with other uh, models. So uh, here, um, let's go to preview one. Yeah. Here uh, we can see uh, the uh, 10 samples from uh, different countries. And that is the 14 days that are withheld for testing. Uh, let's look at closely uh, to the test sample of Greece here on the X axis. You can see uh, the 14 days uh, for the testing periods. Uh, on the Y axis, we can see the number of uh, new cases. So with the black line here, we can see the actual number of new cases, while the blue line here indicates the predicted uh, number of new cases, the mean of the predicted uh, new cases. Uh, the area uh, above and below uh, this uh, mean, this line, this blue area uh, indicates the uncertainty of this model. Uh, so uh, how, how we make the predictions? Um, in order to make predictions, uh, we need to follow three steps. First, choose dates and countries. Second, uh, set uh, the NPI policies. Uh, you can build your own intervention plans by choosing a set of NPIs and set their restrictiveness uh, value, or uh, you can choose one of the predefined intervention plans. Here we have created uh, four uh, predefined intervention plans. And so uh, let's take a look into them. So first is the minimum, uh, minimum policy, um, which means that the restrictiveness level of NPIs is set to zero. And that means no MPIs are applied. The maximum, where the level of strictness uh, of MPIs is at the highest uh, of each MPI. Uh, the freeze, uh, where the level of strictness of the MPIs is that is the same as the last available MPIs uh, before uh, the prediction uh, time period. And the historical, which is the historical level of the strictness uh, for this uh, time uh, period, uh, for the chosen time period. So uh, the first step for to make a prediction is to set the vaccination policies. Uh, again, there are four available plans. Uh, the none, which is uh, no vaccinations are applied. The study 14. Uh, where we use vaccination data of the 14 days before the prediction period. And we calculate uh, the average daily vaccination for this period. Then uh, we assume that the daily vaccinations are according to this uh, average that we have calculated. Uh, also, we have the custom fix where you can set your own uh, fixed uh, value of vaccinations per day. And again, the historical, which is a historical vaccination data of uh, previous uh, that we have used. So uh, let's move on to some uh, historical res results. Here uh, we can see on the left, uh, now we are plotting uh, the smooth uh, confirmed cases. Uh, that is the number of cases uh, moving average over the preceding week. Uh, so here uh, we can see a prediction made uh, for the time period between 15 of January and 15 of February. Again, we use only historical uh, uh, plans uh, for MPIs and vaccinations. We see here that uh, the mean uh, prediction uh, uh, results are similar to the actual one. So that is an indication of a, a good methodology. 
Um, here we can see another example for the dates uh, 1st of August until to 31st of August. Uh, let's move on. Again, some historical results um, to, um, for the October over here and for November of 2021 here. Now let's move on to the what if uh, scenarios. Uh, as I have mentioned before, we construct uh, different uh, what if scenarios in order to um, uh, see what the evolution of the pandemic will be with each uh, within each uh, scenario. Uh, here we provide a uh, first example. Uh, again, it's for the period of. 15th of January until 15th of February of 2021. It's a 30-day uh, forecast. Here we can see uh, the historical, um, we have used the historical MPI plan as uh, we have seen before. Uh, for the vaccination, we have used uh, the steady 14 um, uh, plan as we, as usually in these predictions, we don't have uh, the necessary data. So we uh, have assumed, we have made this assumption uh, for the uh, vaccinations. Um, down here, we can see uh, there are three different uh, scenarios of NPIs. Uh, here, we apply, we apply the freeze scenario where uh, we have uh, set their M, the MPI restrictiveness a level uh, same as in 15th of January. Here we had the historical ones, but here uh, we have set uh, the same uh, that was available in the 15th of January throughout uh, the time, the forecast uh, time period. And as we can see, uh, the mean uh, uh, predicted value uh, should be around uh, 200 here by the end of the predicted period. Um, here is the minimum uh, NPI policy, uh, where again we can see uh, at the end of the prediction uh, time, we, uh, the cases, the smooth cases should be around uh, 350. And here is the maximum uh, NPI policy, uh, where it uh, looks uh, kind of similar uh, for the historical. Um, I think uh, that was the time where in Cyprus we have a mini lockdown, if I remember correctly. So uh, it's um, it's. It's, so that's why it's similar. It, the historical one looks similar to the maximum uh, policy. So uh, let's look at the second example. Uh, again, we focus only on Cyprus. Uh, we are looking at the dates between uh, 10th of May and 31st of May. And uh, now uh, we have assumed that uh, we didn't know any of uh, the NPI policies or the vaccination policies during the forecasted period. Uh, so we set the NPIs to freeze and the vaccination policies to steady 14. So we make this assumption in order to provide a meaningful uh, prediction. And as we can see here, um, if we compare to the actual uh, cases here with the black line, uh, we see that uh, the prediction is very similar to the actual, as uh, at this time period, uh, the NPIs, uh, the uh, government guidelines, uh, remain the same as uh, these, uh, the 15th of May. So during uh, this time period, the NPIs were uh, remain the same as in 15th of May. Uh, so that's why we get a, a similar uh, way. It's very compatible to the uh, forecasted one. So <clears throat> now uh, just uh, some uh, discussion here. Our forecasting uh, does not 
in any way interpret differences between MPIs. And this only uh, needs to be done, uh, it needs to be performed by experts in epidemiology. Uh, we provide, we just provide the tools uh, in order uh, to, uh, so that the experts can uh, take the appropriate intervention plans and the experts uh, need to evaluate any hypothesis if that is uh, whether the differences can be attributed to citizens or if it is a new variant of the disease, if anything else goes on. And depending on the findings, uh, they uh, might need to differentiate uh, the response intervention measures. Uh, so uh, our, uh, uh, we are trying to answer a, a basic question. Uh, what will the evolution of pandemic will be in the short term if we apply uh, different MPI uh, to these periods? And I think that is the uh, main uh, goal that uh, we have, um, uh, the main question that we have answered. Uh, so we use AI uh, to learn uh, how different APIs affect the development of uh, pandemic in different countries. And we made, again, we made the assumption that some countries will respond in a similar ways to the NPIs. And, that's the whole um, idea of the Pandora seal. Uh, as uh, we have shown uh, before, uh, results demonstrate uh, success of this uh, methodology. And in these results are supported by uh, data-driven. Uh, data and so, it could be a part of epidemiological epidemiologist uh, toolkit. So uh, one uh, expert can be uh, use this uh, tool in order to take the appropriate uh, responses. Uh, also, um, this can be expanded uh, to support perhaps AI explainability and um, and. Uh, different other uh, AI um, uh, tools uh, in order to make uh, decision uh, makers, in order to help even more the decision makers. So I think uh, that's all and thank you. Thank you very much, Dimitrianos. Any questions from the audience? Okay, I have a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, how difficult was it to acquire the historical data in order to apply them to the model? Uh, we have used uh, open data, so it was easily it was easy to find uh, those data and train the the model that was the whole. Uh, consumption uh, to use open data so uh, it can be uh, easily trained. If, hey. I, if I can uh, yeah. uh, say a few things. Uh, actually, yeah, that, that was not the difficult uh, part, uh, acquire, acquiring of the data. And uh, hopefully, I don't know if uh, the coronavirus helped us being more <laughs> uh, eager to collect uh, data and uh, people, governments were reporting these uh, things in uh, open databases. We don't know, of course, how accurate or the, the level of accuracy of the data of each country, but we rely on what uh, we have. Mm -hmm. That's very good. Uh, my second question is, in addition to the neural network that you mentioned, did you apply any other methods to make, to extract some results such as graph theory on the pandemic network, from, for example? Uh, we have uh, first experimenting through the compartmental models, as I have shown uh, at the introduction of uh, my presentation, uh, but uh, we didn't uh, get any uh, meaningful results. So we just uh, thought of a different approach so uh, we have uh, uh, 
um, uh, concluded into using the uh, neural network method than any other methods. But uh, we have been experimenting with uh, many models uh, in order to uh, uh, land on this uh, method, on this neural network method. But we didn't go still yet to that uh, uh, graph uh, representation of uh, the infections in the, in, the, in the country. So yeah, we didn't have time actually to go into any other uh, model. This was a nine month uh, project, mm -hmm. but we, we are uh, eager to go into more details if uh, you are into. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much again, Dimitrianos. It was very interesting. Uh, our next presenter for today is Ms. Yoria Lapi. She is a PhD candidate at Cyprus University of Technology. Uh, Yoria, when you are ready, you can start your presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, so, I'm Yoria Lapi. I'm a Uh, can uh, everyone see? Yes, we can see. Okay. So let's begin. Um, so in this presentation, I will uh, describe my project, which is about uh, ultrasound carotid plaque video analysis for the estimation of the risk of stroke. Um, I will um, give you the introduction, the background, and our motivation. Uh, I will talk about our hypothesis and our objective. Um, then I will describe um, the methodology we are developing um, and um, make uh, uh, relations with um, uh, the, as a continuation of our previous work. And uh, then I will talk about our expected outcomes. Um, to begin with, um, as many of you might know, uh, carotid arteries are, uh, are important uh, anatomical components uh, of the neck because um, they, they are responsible for um, the blood uh, to flow um, to the brain and to other um, areas that uh, um, refer to the face. Um, when we talk about uh, carotid atherosclerosis, so we, we refer to cases where uh, the, the carotid artery wall uh, gets thicker and um, the, in um, later, um, uh, later on time, then uh, we might see some plaques uh, formed in carotid arteries. Uh, you can imagine that uh, such a disease uh, has, a, has implications, uh, serious, uh, implications, complications, sorry, um, because uh, as the, the carotid uh, plaque might uh, grow, uh, then uh, the case is that the um, carotid stenosis is also developing, which has uh, which results in a reduced blood flow. And there are also other cases when we, we meet uh, plaques that are unstable um, according to their structure and they may rupture. And then some of their components may travel through the bloodstream and uh, cause uh, stroke. Um, when, uh, when this phenomenon is uh, in early stages, um, we might see some uh, therapies uh, followed by, by the individuals that are affected. Uh, this could be therapy with statins or aspirin uh, as a way to, to facilitate uh, the plaque recreation. Uh, but uh, in extreme cases, um, uh, when uh, we have stenosis uh, in the, the carotid artery up to 80%, uh, what is uh, done is that um, um, there is surgery that is called endarterectomy where the, um, the plaque is uh, has been removed. But uh, even in these uh, cases, uh, we might uh, also see that uh, there are there is high risk of stroke during the operation. Then, if the the, the risk of uh, the plaque being formed is uh, less than the risk uh, we that occurs during an operation, then why should we operate? And um, now. Um, and a way uh, to actually that helps actually the, the physicians and the experts to, to have an idea of what's happening inside the carotid uh, artery is the, the B-mode uh, ultrasound uh, uh, technique. Um, it is a, a simple technique. It is non-invasive and cost-effective. Um, here, um, again, we, we can see again the, the areas of the carotid artery uh, of one of two sides of the neck. Uh, we can see the internal part, the external part. Um, we can see the common 
uh, Canal de Darte, and we also see the area of the bifurcation and uh, a plaque, a carotid kind of plaque that is uh, annotated. And the cases that in most of the cases, uh, these plaques are, uh, are formed uh, around the bifurcation area. Um, this is a, an important uh, table that uh, I, I want you to understand that from a previous study, uh, where uh, the, the stenosis uh, degree was from 50% to 79%, um, and the, the black area was also measured. Um, as we can see here, uh, where the, the risk of stroke was, uh, the stroke rate, let's say, was estimated, uh, we can see that when we, we have um, uh, individuals with um, um, big black area, um, Either with history or not, we see notable uh, uh, rates of uh, of uh, stroke, uh, but also we can see a five percent that's in, that's also notable in uh, in plaques that are smaller. Um, therefore, what could we do more to actually have a better understanding? Um, then the idea is to actually investigate what is the plaque structure. But that is going to help us uh, understand the pro problem better. Uh, when we we are um, let's say visually inspecting uh, ultrasound videos, uh, some characteristics that um, accompany symptomatic and asymptomatic plaques are given here in this table. Uh, asymptomatic plaques, you can understand, they are more dangerous. And when we see such areas in in such videos, they they present as brighter with less contrast, more smooth more homogeneous, more periodical, and um, in some cases, we might see large areas with uh, small gray tone variations. So here in, a, in another previous uh, work is another way of showing uh, when we see the plaques, uh, when we see the either bright regions or dark regions, or regions somewhere in between. When we have dark regions, another way to understand what is the, com uh, the, the composition of the plaques is that dark regions are more associated with uh, uh, lipids, thrombus, blood, or hemorrhage. And on the other side, when we see more bright regions, um, it's mostly calcified uh, areas or uh, collagen-related areas. Uh, then, based on the above, um, our hypothesis is that um, we, we hypothesize that uh, in order to de better decide uh, if a plaque is uh, dangerous or not, we could um, investigate that we could, we could analyze their structure. When we talk about the appearance they have in ultrasound videos, we talk about the ultrasonic textural and morphological characteristics we see. Um, based on this uh, hypothesis, we are developing a, a system that uh, it will integrate uh, several steps as a way to, uh, to support the, the decision making for uh, stroke risk stratification and, and assist the experts when they have to decide. Um, this system um, in this, this system, we'll perform a, an automatic uh, a plaque ROI segmentation using uh, deep learning models. And then from these uh, segmented uh, areas, we will extract uh, features, textual and motion, ex I will explain later. Uh, the most explanatory ones will be selected we will, and we, we will be uh, passed through a classification model. And then um, the idea is to give an overall uh, answer if it is about a symptomatic case or an asymptomatic case. This way, uh, we expect to, to uh, facilitate early diagnosis, disease uh, prevention, monitoring even, uh, or even um, uh, help the physicians uh, provide a better treatment. Uh, so starting uh, with the first step, um, the, the idea is that uh, we have the opportunity to select and load the carotid ultrasound video. And um, the first important, uh, it's, let's, let's say, part is to pre-process the video to first configure the, the resolution, uh, perform pixel intensity normalization, or even uh, remove uh, noise that's, um, that's also referred to as the speckling. Uh, that's a um, uh, method um, that is um, been um, developed uh, from by our group in previous studies. And then there are two main pathways. In the first pathway, we allow the user 
in this case could be the expert, to visually investigate the video and extract um, information that uh, is mostly he, he can uh, interact manually. Um, first, um, the expert can uh, manually annotate uh, the plaque in a selected uh, video frame. And then um, if, uh, if it is needed, they can also, uh, by visually, again, by visually inspecting, they can also detect uh, uh, video frames that uh, mostly refer to systole or diastole during a cardiac cycle. Because let us not forget that um, through, the, through the ultrasound videos in the carotid artery, we can also notice uh, the movement uh, in the carotid artery components during the cardiac cycles. So uh, the, the expert may uh, conclude to an overall uh, diagnosis if it is a symptomatic or a symptomatic case. This was the, the first uh, path. In a second path, where mostly all of the things will be done automatically from here and on, uh, the same video, the pre-processed video, uh, will be used uh, to derive uh, what is called an M-mode uh, image. This image, let's, uh, let's uh, imagine that you, you have um, a video frame uh, and uh, then you select two points on, on a vertical uh, line and uh, you want to see how these points, how their uh, distance changes throughout the whole video. This actually, if you can imagine about it, it, it gives um, um, it gives us the overall uh, movement um, from the selected area throughout the video. So this type of image, this type of images help us to derive cardiac state diagrams. These diagrams actually show the, the difference in, between these two points, uh, let's say. And from these diagrams, you can um, automatically derive um, the systolic and diastolic frames. Uh, at this point, I would like to say that it is uh, it is um, uh, plausible to to compare uh, what are the indices from the video frames that refer to systole and diastole, those that were manually uh, extracted uh, seen by the, the expert, and those that were automatically extracted by the processing uh, the second pathway. Then, um, so by selecting a video frame. Uh, and uh, having a, a previously trained uh, uh, deep learning segmentation model, um, the, the idea is to actually use this to segment the, the plaque uh, region of interest and uh, also extract some uh, motion features from this area. So uh, after, uh, after that, the next step is that uh, let's um, recall that the, the, the expert uh, has the opportunity to annotate the area manually. So what we can extract and uh, um, um, perform statistical anal analysis uh, about this selected as the overall number of pixels, let's say, that uh, form the area or even the pixel coordinates that form the area and compare these um, between the manual and the automatically uh, extracted from the segmented area. And then uh, from the another thing we can do is uh, to from the is to also perform statistical analysis um, in uh, the features that we, we can extract. Uh, again, morphological features, you remember from the previous slides, what we can actually see in the ultrasound images, we can extract this feature automatically segmented areas. Uh, again, we refer to an area from the same uh, selected uh, frame of the same video, and we can establish um, either uh, correlations or uh, find the differences. These uh, textural features uh, that will be extracted from the selected ROI of the selected frame will be combined uh, with uh, motion, the motion features again extracted by this, this certain ROI. And the most explanatory ones from both of the types of features will be selected. And uh, again, as, uh, as, as I said earlier, the, we, will be, we will use a binary classification model to actually have a result uh, as if the case is symptomatic or asymptomatic. And uh, that's a way to actually assist the expert have a, a verification about their primary decision. 
So this, this was the overall idea that uh, uh, except from uh, textual features that uh, can be derived uh, uh, using, uh, using also previous approaches, I will refer to them uh, later, from, used from our group. Um, we will incorporate the deep learning part. Uh, uh, we will be able to make the, the segmentation part uh, to, 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 to automate this. And uh, we will also combine the textual feature with motion features. That's uh, even more uh, interesting to see. As there is also previous work from our group uh, showing uh, how uh, how the stable and unstable plaques uh, uh, behave during the cardiac cycles, uh, referring to their motion. Uh, so the first and most important part in such a, an analysis is the quality and the quantity of the data that we can be used. We start with a database uh, that uh, we anonymize it, uh, and uh, this um, consists of uh, atherosclerotic ultrasound videos. Each video, it is important for us in order to be able to train also the segmentation model. Each video is uh, accompanied by an annotated, the annotated plug area. It, if there is one plug, there is uh, one ROI file with the coordinates. If there are two plaques in video, there are two uh, ROI files. Um, on the right, uh, you can see examples of uh, what we actually have from the beginning to be used uh, for uh, training, let's say, the, the segmentation model. Um, on the top, we see an asymptomatic case. We see a longitudinal queue, and we see the plaque uh, being annotated. This, uh, imagine this uh, annotation is extracted by an expert uh, as a first step. And uh, at the bottom, we can see a symptomatic case, again, with the plaque uh, being annotated. The primary, this primary database we have uh, will be enriched uh, over time, prospectively, um, uh, collecting data from the parties you can see below. Um, and um, what, what else I, I want to say is um, all of this idea, uh, that's uh, an extension of previous work from our group, because there, um, there is a lot of uh, previous uh, research uh, done. And um, here you can see some core studies uh, uh, from our group uh, where it is indeed shown that uh, texture and motion features in carotid ultrasound black arise um, can, can indeed um, be used to distinguish, uh, to successfully distinguish between uh, symptomatic and asymptomatic cases. And um, yes, the idea is we want to uh, combine the textual features with the motion features. And we also want to incorporate the deep learning uh, segmentation model in, in the whole system. Um, with this overall system, therefore, we expect that um, we will derive uh, meaningful quantitative measures been able to, to differentiate between the symptomatic and asymptomatic cases, and finally, indeed, quantify the risk of stroke. Thank you for your attention, and uh, we'll be glad to, to have any questions. Thank you very much, Georgia, for your great presentation. Uh, I see Vangelis have a question. Vangelis? Feel free to open your microphone or leave it in the chat. Uh, uh, sorry, it was a clap. <laughs> for congratulations. Uh, you don't have any questions? Uh, can you hear me? Uh, no, uh, said that it was a clap for the Congratulations. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, Georgia, thank you again. It was very clear. We don't have any questions. Our next presenter is Andreas Georgiou. He is a master's student at the University of Cyprus, and he's going to present to us the topic an adaptive semi automated integrated system for multiple sclerosis, lesion, segmentation in long longitude. MRI scans based on a convolutional neural network. Hello, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes. Hello. Hello. Okay, very well. So, 
Hello everyone, my name is Andrea Giorgio and today I would like to present my final year project from my master's degrees. Um, but firstly, I will, I will quickly introduce myself. Uh, so I have received my bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and my master's degree in biomedical engineering, both from the Department of uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering and Informatics of the Cyprus University of Technology. Um, my grade uh, their interests are in the field of automation, robotics, and last but not but least, um, in image processing. Um, the title of today's presentation in, uh, is the Adaptive Integrated System for Multiple Sclerosis Lesion Segmentation in a Longitudinal MRI Scan and based on a convolutional neural network. Um, these are the main points that I will focus a brief introduction to provide the general idea of, of this project, the methodology that I follow, the outcome and the potential further uh, research in the, in the future. Uh, so to, what, what we characterize multiple sclerosis as a clinical problem. Multiple sclerosis is a chronic autoimmune and the malign disease of great clinical importance affecting the human central nervous system it is gradually changing the brain, white matter, texture, morphology, and structure due to the myelin uh, state damage. Um, in simple words, uh, uh, we want to define the segmented specific areas in the brain that uh, shows uh, the myelin uh, damage. They can easily be identified in the flare images as well, white spots, as we can see in the bottom right corner of the figure here and here and here with the red vectors. Um, the importance is so the precise segmentation of the multiple sclerosis lesions uh, is an important task for understanding and characterize the progression of the disease, providing quantitative assessment and positive impact on the quality uh, of life of them and uh, of course of their families. The aforementioned clinical problem motivates machine learning experts uh, to develop automated lesion uh, segmentation techniques, which can be order of magnitude faster and immune the, to expert bias. Um, so the main difficulties in diagnosis multiple sclerosis clinical problem is that uh, brain MRI, uh, MRI images have a wide range of data and of course a complex brain biological structure. Um, a small amount of available uh, data sets for clinical uh, practice are not easily available. And uh, another one is MRI images have a big deviation of the final scan images based on the different, different MRI scanners brands. The existing methods are time consuming, tedious and prone to intra and inter observer variability. Uh, so what we propose, uh, it is not uh, an innovate, uh, innovation, neither a complicated solution, but it's a simple, uh, simple solution that comes for, uh, as a reflection from the human nature. We use the same approach that human use to learn and improve their knowledge. Sorry. Um, the proposed uh, CNN uh, integrated system have a progressive evolution through the time of use, more specifically a manual error correction a module was incorporated. Uh, this module improves the model segmentation accuracy by incorporating the user input. The training procedure uh, is not um, executed at once, but is uh, repeated at regular intervals, making the training procedure part of the automated segmentation process, and not, uh, not only at the initial stage uh, of training the CNN model. Uh, so let's have a look at the structural arrangement of this system. The proposed system is based on the following uh, interconnected procedures. Initially, we retrieve uh, a data set from multiple sclerosis patients so we can train our neural network. We have uh, to process uh, the data in advance before it's fed uh, back into the convolutional net neural network and information uh, is uh, proceeded inside the neural network. And finally, a post procedure has to implement and extract it from the final multiple sclerosis lesion segmentation of the patient uh, brain. Um, in this case, we have used the ISBI dataset from uh, 2015 uh, challenge of longitudinal multiple sclerosis uh, lesion segmentation. The training uh, set consists of five subjects, but this is not.
looks like that uh, Andreas has a connection problem. We'll give him, we'll give him some time to come back. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see your screen. Uh, at what uh, time point, uh, what size uh, slice uh, do you miss me? Yeah, I think we are here, uh, where you okay. are now. Okay, very well. So um, in this case, we use the, the SBI data set uh, from two, 2015 a challenge for longitudinal and multiple sclerosis lesion segmentation. And the training set consists of five subjects, four of which had uh, four time points, uh, while the 50 subjects had five time points. MRI images sequences have been retrieved from the 3.0 Tesla MRI scanner. And more specifically, in our case, we use the flare uh, images uh, sequences that shows a much greater contrast compared to the other MRI, MRI sequences. And the pre-processing procedure is based on a three sub uh, process. Firstly, and the images were rescaled to a fixed size of 256 pixels of width and weight that correspond to the input size of the first layer of the convolutional neural network. Afterwards, uh, the images were uni uniformly intestine normalized in a range zero to one. And finally, a number random, randomly deformed uh, transformations of the training images were, were seen implemented in the from MRI image of recommendation, including small uh, random rotations, uh, translations, scaling, shifting, and zooming. Of course, uh, in, the, in the future, um, uh, when we would have more uh, data, more realistic data, uh, this stage can be reduced uh, by adapting the, the neural network to more realistic medical conditions, more, more realistic uh, data we have more accuracy in our system. Um, a CNN-based uh, uh, neural network in architecture of a unit model was used to implement the proposed segmentation systems. The model consists of six down sample blocks followed by the six uh, up sample blocks uh, here and here. Um, for the activation factor, a rectified linear U was used, uh, a really, uh, yes, uh, for neural reality was used, and a kernel three by three pixel was selected across the network. All down sampling convolution had a two by two max pooling operation with a stride of two for down sampling, uh, where the image's size was kept constantly by using the same uh, padding, zero padding. Uh, we use the simplest version of a unit uh, architecture as shown in the figure. The convolutional part in the left uh, uh, side and the, thing, uh, the, the convolutional part of the network is on the right. Um, and finally, in the final step of the post-processing of information and Gaussian filter uh, uh, was used to remove the adaptive noise uh, with a kernel of five of seven by seven pixels. Uh, a kernel was, uh, uh, the kernel size was empirically derived through experimentations and selected uh, through the training procedure. Then Gaussian filter decreases the add additive noise and removes small false, false positive uh, regions. In addition to that, a threat, uh, a threat swat was applied after the image uh, denoising. Uh, the threat swat value was defined so that the maximum dissimilarity similarity coefficient was achieved and the value was estimated through experimentations. Uh, this value has not been uh, standardized but it's tuned accordingly uh, to each different data set. And, uh, and finally, the basic uh, functional uh, steps of our proposed system are listed here. The user uh, starts from the beginning to train uh, the untrained model based on his data. Each time the user enter um, new data into the system, there is a possibility for manual error correction, uh, as we can see with the yellow uh, here, uh, user enters new data into the system. 
this uh, data enter uh, is entered into the central database. So as a result, so the train data of the model is gradually increased. We do this looping each time uh, new data is uh, inserted into the system. So uh, it's a well-known fact that uh, a greater data set uh, in neural networks are having more accurate and realistic data, which is uh, leading to better results. So the main element of our proposed system is shown in the gray rectangle here. Um, in the upper part of the figure is uh, more like a dynamic model rather than a static uh, one, which the model parametric is changing through the time, adapting to the uh, user needs. Uh, is kind. Uh, this solution is tailored to the needs of the of the user. Um, uh, this is the coefficient that we have used, and that similarity coefficient, sensitivity, and precision uh, was evaluation metrics uh, for this for our uh, case on our system. And uh, here we will see our results. And here we can uh, see the visualization results for the segmentation of the proposed system compared to the manual segmentation results of an expert at the final time points of the training of, of training our system. With a quick uh, look, we noticed that the two segmentations have a, a great agreement. Uh, we see with the blue ones, the expert delineations, and with the green ones, the automatic segmentation of our system. We see that uh, it's overlap uh, each one. And here we have a very, very good uh, prediction of our model. Uh, here is another very good example. Here we see a case of our system find more lesions uh, with greens as, as, as we can see. That may be the expert miss or maybe it's a fault from, us, uh, from our system uh, side. Here um, uh, is, the, and in the next slide, we see the visualization progress of, of accuracy for the proposed system through the time. Each time a new patient uh, visits, uh, for example, uh, to the doctor, we see an improvement of the accuracy of the CNN uh, model. We see here we have uh, 0.17. Yes. Here we have at the final stage, we, uh, we have a more accurate, accurate results. We clearly, see, uh, we clearly see that each time the system infused with new data from patient, and the interaction from the user, the accuracy of the system uh, increase. The, incompar the incorporation of the manual error correction was implemented as a new feature in the proposed segmentation system produce uh, a gradual improvement to the system, which were presented in, the, uh, in this graph. More specifically, the graph shows the increase of the DSC from uh, 0.6 to uh, 0. 18 every time the system interact with the user and new data is imported uh, to the database. Of course, uh, the improvements come to, uh, as we can see, to a saturation. Uh, this is a basic cause uh, to the complexity, the biological complexity of, uh, of our problem. Um, in this study, and that similarity coefficient was achieved uh, by 0 0.7, and uh, using our proposed system, a higher uh, similarity coefficient of uh, 0 0.82 was achieved when the proposed system was evaluated at the last time point images. All types of supervised uh, neural networks is uh, compatible with uh, the proposed uh, system. Um, the benefits of the proposed system is that uh, it can be tailored ac according to the user needs, have a continuous improvement of accuracy through the time, and has better performance on, all on already uh, registered patients. Uh, of course, uh, there are also some limitations to the proposed system. Uh, in the early stages, training stages, of the model training demands more increased uh, user interaction. As we know, we don't have uh, sufficient data to train our model. And, uh, and at the very first uh, step of training our model, uh, uh, we have a manual uh, error correction, of course, from the user. 
Another thing limitation is that the system performance de depends on the ability of the user. If a user creates a wrong uh, error correction, the, the, uh, the system, of course, uh, will not predict very well uh, the results. In a future study, we intend to apply the proposed system in a large uh, uh, image database as well as to evaluate in a real life uh, clinic applications. Uh, to conclude, we are in a very uh, early stage of implementing a console with a touchscreen capability so that a uh, user can easily perform the correction of the predictions of a neural network model. Also, we're trying to incorporate and, uh, other subsystems uh, to the general uh, uh, systems such as uh, 3D volume uh, lesions visualization and extract lesion uh, surface uh, characteristic, characteristics and texture for uh, better assessment of the, of the disease. And we intend uh, this system to be used uh, as a part of multiple uh, subsystems that will be sharing uh, the weights of each of the model to a centralized uh, database, giving the opportunity to be evaluated and uh, evaluate the correctness of each uh, segmentation between uh, subsystems. And this is a, a, a this is correlated works uh, on this uh, on this project. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Attention. If we have time, I can ask you to any questions you have. Thank you very much, Andreas. Any questions from the audience? Okay, it looks like we don't have any questions. Uh, we will continue with a 10 minute break and then continue to the last presentations. Thank you very much Thank again. You. Bye bye. Have a nice See continue. You See you in a bit.
Okay, I think we can continue. Uh, our next our next presenter for today are Professor Willem Jan from the Geronimus Academy of Data Science and Professor Girt Monsieur from the Department of Data Engineering of Tilburg University. Professors, when you are ready, you can start your presentation. Yeah, sure, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm not sure, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, great. Then I'm going to share my screen with you. Okay. Okay, here we go. Um, I'm not sure. Is this, is the screen? Yes, everything is all right. Everything is right. fine. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay, good. So then I'll slowly get, uh, get started. So uh, first of all, a very warm welcome. And thank you very much for uh, having us uh, presenting our latest work in the area of data products, uh, data meshes and marketplaces. So this uh, will be a presentation that will be jointly given by my colleague, uh, it's uh, Professor Geert Monsieur and myself. My name is Wilhelm van den Heuvel and both of us indeed uh, uh, are uh, given this presentation uh, from let's say the JAPS uh, University. So, so uh, very shortly, for those of you who are not, not aware of JATS, so JATS is joint venture between two universities. It's Tilburg University uh, that specializes in social sciences and the Technical University of Eindhoven that uh, really all revolves around engineering. So JATS brings two worlds together, the world of engineering and social sciences. And um, in fact, this is also our take on our collaboration within the context of destiny. So uh, what we are trying to do is we're trying to blend in, uh, let's say, uh, both data intensive technologies, but also uh, taking into consideration business aspects and uh, legal aspects. So and, and this uh, view on our research uh, will be reflected throughout uh, today's presentation. So now let's continue with a brief overview of this talk. So first of all, uh, I wanna take you on a short journey uh, in the area of distributed data and distributed data processing for you guys to better understand the notion of data meshes, which is here on the second point. And then I will also gently introduce to you the topic of data products because of the fact that data products are grounded on data meshes, in fact, at least in many, many cases of more contemporary approaches. Then I will briefly introduce GAIA-X because it will slowly start to become a European backbone to uh, enable uh, data marketplaces and the trade of data products uh, throughout uh, Europe. And uh, GAIA-X, in fact, is a very important uh, development that uh, we are taking into account, in fact, not only with a destiny, but also our future work. Then I will do a very gentle handshake to my colleague, Monsieur, and he will share with uh, you our latest uh, insights in data marketplaces. In fact, we have started a couple of projects also with, uh, for example, big industrials like uh, Daimler, who is very much interested in data products, for example, to better allow sharing data, for example, to train uh, uh, autonomic uh, vehicles with uh, other companies in Germany, like BMW, for example. And we also started a, a collaboration with the ASML, and ASML uh, is a Dutch uh, uh, company which is uh, located uh, close to the Eindhoven area, the Brainport area. And uh, it uh, provides, in fact, uh, um, machines to produce uh, computer chips. So, uh, and what we'll try to do during today's presentation is here and there also hint toward that. And in fact, the research that I'm going to share with you this morning will be injected in a destiny uh, through our collaboration with Sapienza University in Rome. And we are setting up in in fact, uh, research and development activities along the lines sketched in this presentation, but of course, also with our partners in Cyprus, from Cyprus University of Technology. And with uh, them, we are considering, for example, the usage of blockchain as a uh, data, let's say, infrastructure that uh, is trustworthy and uh, safe and, uh, and secure. So, and if time allows us, uh, then toward the end of uh, today's uh, 
uh, presentation will sketch a couple of routes for our future work. Now, the idea is that uh, um, uh, the distributed data and data meshes, in fact, at the end of the day, they have a lot of resemblance with uh, service-oriented computing and service-oriented architectures. And this, uh, I guess, uh, undercurrent of these contemporary data meshes and data products will be exemplified uh, toward the end of today's presentation. And this is why we gave the uh, presentation the name that services are in fact in rebound. Uh, and uh, we'll elaborate on this topic uh, also throughout uh, uh, today's uh, talk. By the way, toward the end of uh, today's uh, lecture, there is an opportunity to have a bit of discussion. We're looking forward to that, to get, uh, I guess, uh, your questions or your ideas or your recommendations uh, with respect to this line of work. So now let's get slowly started. By the way, the, the slides which I'm going to present to you now for the coming, uh, I guess, 10 minutes, uh, which revolve around the theme of data frameworks, they are largely borrowed from uh, articles which you can find on the link on the website of Martin Fowler, who some of you may in fact uh, know. So let's uh, look a little bit uh, into the past and then look ahead to the future. So what is this data all about? I mean. The first generation of uh, distributed data uh, architectures revolved around data warehouses, right? So a data warehouse was a very nice way uh, to allow for the integration of various distributed and very heterogeneous databases. And in this case, I graphically depicted three data sources, but in principle, it could be numerous data sources that could be mapped to a central, let's say, data bucket or data warehouse. Typically, these types of approaches would assume batch processing, and also they were, were grounded on a paradigm which is called ETL. And ETL stands for extraction, transformation, and then loading the data into the data warehouse. And data warehouses, they started to emerge toward the end of the 90s, and they were really picked up, uh, I guess, in, in the 20s. And in fact, they still play a very important role for companies to uh, integrate their enterprise data. Now, uh, the data stored in data warehouses could then be visualized and could be accessed through various reporting technologies, all types of all up, uh, uh, approaches to better analyze them, for example, to analyze trends in data. And also these data warehouses would allow for data mining to, uh, let's say, better understand business problems and to uh, uh, devise uh, structured solutions based on simulations. So this is uh, roughly the first generation of uh, technologies that have been in place. Now, if you look at the second generation, we saw the uh, introduction of data lakes. So where typically the data warehouses would assume a relatively static environment, a relatively closed environment with respect to the data and the data sources, and also an environment that would assume structured data and structured data only, uh, the data lakes would loosen up on these assumptions, right? So, and this is sometimes called the open world assumption. So what data lakes would do is they would not only cater for structured data, but in fact also allow for unstructured or semi-structured data, for example, stored in XML files, JSON files, CSVs files, just to give you a couple of examples. And then at the same time, data lakes would also loosen up on the assumption that most data would reside in fact within the confines of an enterprise. So what data lakes would do, um, they would also allow open data to be incorporated. And uh, this would mean uh, that uh, these types of data typically would be ingested as raw data, which could be very much unstructured, right? So it could be pictures also, it could be text, uh, it could be any type of data, in fact. And not any longer, this data would come to us in a batch-oriented way, what, like assumed by data warehouses, but this data, in fact, would uh, uh, reach us streaming. And uh, what companies, of course, would then uh, um, expect from uh, the modern day uh, data integration technologies is uh, facilities to have dynamic uh, streaming and dynamic uh, close to real time or even real time analysis of this data. 
So the ingestion of the data stemming from operational enterprise systems and also emerging data sources, which are typically open data sources, is depicted here at the left-hand side of this, uh, of this slide. And then uh, here in the middle, of course, resides the data lake. The data lake would uh, not assume structured data, like I've just said, and it would typically uh, uh, store the data in, in, in raw format. So it would not have this ETL paradigm in place, like uh, typically for the data warehouses, but it would simply ingest all data which it got and uh, would uh, then start to better understand the data on the fly. So whenever there would be a, uh, let's say, reporting which need, uh, needed to be done, or whenever you would uh, need some interactive and real-time visualization, the data lake would then and only then start, let's say, surfing on the data in the data lake uh, through data discovery mechanisms, which you can see here, and only then on demand do the data transformations, right? Uh, these data lakes, they, uh, they come with data governance mechanisms, for example, to better understand data quality. And where data quality for the data warehouses was something which was still quite straightforward, because everything more or less would live within tables, data quality is an exceedingly uh, uh, difficult topic in those environments which are very heterogeneous uh, with respect to the data. For example, how to measure the data of free and open text, right? But this is still very much in fact in uh, an open research area, which uh, we also study at JATS. And um, moreover, these data lakes would uh, not only use data mining and machine learning for the purpose of uh, answering queries or doing predictions, but also, for example, employ machine learning and deep learning approaches for more intelligent and semantically driven data discovery. So this is then the second uh, generation of uh, technologies which started to emerge something already like uh, seven, eight years ago and um, uh, were supported typically also by not only the technologies of the giants, the IT giants, but typically also technologies that you could find um, in open source uh, environments. Now, if we then extrapolate from the first uh, to the second, into the third generation, you can see the uh, introduction of Lambda and Kappa architectures. So in particular, what the Lambda architecture would do is it would allow for really for huge amounts of data to be processed, uh, both in a batch way, in a batch oriented lay, uh, uh, way, and also through, let's say, real-time facilities, which would be um, uh, uh, enabled through the speed layer. So typically how the Kappa architecture would work is that it would assume some data to be imported into the data lake through batch uh, processes. And then, um, and it would perform these batch uh, processing a, a, uh, on a regular basis. But in between these times that the batch processing would be done, you would have to speed layer in fact, to provide for a real time view uh, to answer queries uh, stated by, I guess, the enterprise users of these types of Lambda and Kata architecture enabled data lakes. And here at the, uh, let's say, lower end of this figure, you can see, in fact, an example of a Kata architecture that would blend, that would merge the batch and speed layer and would simply assume, in fact, everything would revolve around stream processing, which, of course, would assume much more processing capacity that gradually became available over the past few years. I'm um, seeing I'm taking a little bit too much time now and uh, but explaining, I guess, the generation. But I think it's important that you have this view of, uh, of the history of enterprise distributed data processing to really understand and appreciate the notion of data meshes. So as you can see on this very colorful picture, um, uh, there is uh, a data mesh. And the, the data mesh, it would uh, not any longer assume that the data would be stored centrally. I mean, this is something which was assumed by both data lakes and also the data warehouses. But what data meshes cater for is that the data is owned and is kept still distributed. So very close to where the data has been generated. And in this way also, what the data meshes would cater for is that at the, at the end of the day, you would correlate, cross-correlate the data which is distributed, right? So in case there were a query, 
you could jump, let's say, from one distributed uh, data bucket to the other one. And with this is exemplified through these uh, dotted lines right here to extract the data which is needed to answer particular queries. And now over the past few years, uh, I think two years, we see the uh, uptake of data meshes and we see also the introduction of data mesh type of technologies and also the um, introduction for standards to allow for the, in, let's say, interoperability uh, and connectivity between the distributed uh, data hubs living within data meshes. So let's look a little bit deeper into the data meshes, uh, given the fact that we think uh, they will become uh, the preferred distributed enterprise computing technology to enable for data products. So let's look at it a little bit more. And this slide firstly delves a little bit uh, deeper into data meshes, which hopefully will not become a, a mess, which is uh, exemplified here at the left hand side of, of this figure. So why data meshes? Because we had a data lakes, but uh, it seemed that uh, in case we needed uh, transformations, for example, for data warehouses, 70 to 80% of these digital transformations in fact fail at the end of the day. This, is, uh, this has a couple of reasons. For example, due to the fact that these transformations can be exceedingly uh, intricate, complicated, very hard to maintain, and they are especially very uh, brittle, let's say, in those environments uh, that are evolving very quickly. Because each time that a source uh, database would change, which falls in fact outside your span of control, you, will, you would have to really find these uh, transformations. Now also, uh, we saw the rise of distributed cloud, uh, let's say, architectures, which uh, all have been becoming less and less centralized. And uh, they less and less assume a very monolithic and homogeneous environment. Also, um, uh, what happened uh, through uh, data lakes and data warehouses was a lock-in, a lock-in in, in particular clouds. Whilst these days, what we assume is a very heterogeneous, or what we want to assume is a heterogeneous cloud environment where you are not dependent on one single cloud provider only. Um, also, the data lakes, just to focus a little bit more on that, they are rarely uh, successful in practice. And uh, on top of it, they are also only analytics focused. But besides analytics, there's much more also to run the operational and day-to-day -day, uh, business processes within your uh, organization. So um, in fact, uh, what the data meshes do is they go beyond a distributed computing technology only. They also focus on a change in mindset toward considering data not only as, as raw data, but in fact data as a product that can be consumed, okay? That encapsulate at the end of, uh, of the day a piece of data which is cohesive and consistent, for example, within the context of the use in a business process. And also on top of that, it sees data really as a product that can be consumed, that thus should also be paid for by other enterprise uh, users, uh, which uh, at the end of the day also assumes that you would need things like metering facilities and billing facilities aside of the typical, let's say, provisioning methods and technologies which could be assumed. Also what uh, the data mesh approach calls for is an alignment across various uh, operational and also dispersed uh, data domains. So, and it would then at the end of the day, like I've just tried to explain already, uh, cater not only for on-premise uh, uh, calculations and uh, um, computing, but also computing in a, in a very uh, uh, wide multi-cloud data network. So there is, uh, in our view, uh, four key attributes of the data mesh, which are important. It's to start thinking about data in terms of data products. Uh, it uh, also uh, promotes decentralization um, of uh, data architectures and at the same time, data-driven, uh, sorry, event-driven data ledgers. So typically data meshes are supported through different types of ledger uh, technologies, including, but not only, uh, um, blockchain technologies and also polyglot data streaming, which in fact simply means that uh, 
data streaming at the end of the day can be very heterogeneous again in itself. So um, the data thinking it, uh, can be grounded on already existing practices, like for example, design thinking, which is employed for, to solve so-called wicked problems and devising data products is in fact a wicked problem. And also theories uh, which uh, um, stem from the area of marketing effect, which is jobs to be done theory, for example, which emphasizes the consumer or data customer focus uh, in, in data products. So I guess I slowly, uh, I, I can skip a couple of these slides because I think you understand now the gist. Uh, an important technological underpinning uh, will uh, be provided by the GAIA-X uh, uh, architecture, which is a huge European initiative that again also promotes the things already alluded to like federation, decentralization and openness as key principles. And this is a, a uh, let's say a development at the European level, which will become uh, more and more important, we believe, uh, in 2020, and uh, will also uh, evolve from, let's say, uh, specifications, uh, which is currently, I guess, the state, the stage in which the Gaia technology stack resides into actual implementations, and a particular partners like Daimler, ASML, and a couple of other big industry players are very much interested in this, and in fact, also support explicitly the Gaia X initiative. This is why I wanted to mention it here anyway. So I think uh, I am now through my material and uh, here uh, I'm going to give the floor now to you. Yes, uh, thank you, Romian. So yeah, um, first of all, also welcome from my side. Uh, and so the next few uh, slides in the next couple of minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, mainly data marketplaces. And uh, together with, with this topic, let's say, I also I'm going to spend uh, a few minutes on, let's say, data products in general, because uh, this is obviously something which connects, I think, uh, the previous part, data meshes, and uh, the next part, data markets. Um, so, yeah, first of all, I think it's always good to come up with some, some clear definitions and, and a good view on, let's say, what, what the data market is. And if you, if you study the literature, if you study uh, also the, the, the gray literature, you can easily find many different definitions of data markets. Huh? Uh, some people say, okay, a data market is nothing else than let's say a digital market. And, and there's mainly one goal, eh? uh, making it easy to, to exchange data, but uh, people also have to pay for the data. So monetizing data is basically the main goal. Eh? Other people say, oh, look, uh, data market is not simply about monetizing data. It's simply about exchanging indeed the data, exchanging data products in such a way that it is convenient, let's say, for, for all actors involved. Huh? Um, of course, if you think about this convenience, then you can immediately wonder, okay, what exactly does that mean? Huh? And one of the dimensions I think, think of uh, convenience could be is simply uh, the fact that indeed you receive money, but perhaps also other things are important, which makes it even more difficult to come up with a good data market design. Uh, finally, some people say, look, a data market uh, needs to be much more, uh, it needs to be a platform in which you can also uh, enable, let's say, new ways of, of, of combining data, new ways of creating value, of, of discovering the data, and so on. So it can be much more. Um, so next slide, please. So um, anyhow, if you, if you study all these definitions, I think uh, quite often there are four main concepts, let's say, that, that you find in almost all definitions. Huh? So data markets are about uh, data products. Uh, and, and again, this is, I think, uh, also what you typically are going to share in, in the data mesh. Uh, but additionally, I think in the data market, you typically also speak about data providers and data consumers, because these are essentially the main uh, actress, let's say, who are going to exchange data. And of course, at the end of the day, it's all about data exchange. So these are the four main concepts of uh, data markets. Um, so yeah, obviously, if we consider these uh, concepts, I think it's a good uh, idea to also, let's say, define these uh, concepts. And I think one of the key things that uh, should be defined is, is what a data product is. Huh? 
But in fact, before we uh, describe what the data product is, I think it's also good to, to think about the data asset. Huh? What is a data asset? Well, a data asset is nothing else than, let's say, any digitally stored information or data that has potentially a value. Huh? Um, and so um, as soon as you somehow try to make this data asset available on a data market, then it becomes what, uh, what we typically refer to as a data product. Huh? And so what's the main difference then between the data product and the data asset? Well, I would say that the data product is indeed uh, much more, it's, it's optimized for the consumption by, by consumers. Uh, and so what, what does that mean in, in, in particular? Well, it means that, for instance, there is a clear way of accessing the data. So you create access points, but perhaps there's also uh, meta models, data models involved, standardization of the data, uh, perhaps also usage policies. So basically there's much more that you need once you would like to uh, expose data assets, let's say, as a data product. Next slide. So yeah, this is another uh, another view, let's say, on what the data product then could be. Uh, um, in fact, what you see here on the slide, I think, are very very similar things that uh, I discussed in the previous slide. Uh, um, however, additionally, I think this slide also contains, uh, let's say, the difference between the data owner and the data provider, and indeed. Uh, a data provider is something which is going to provide a data product uh, and it's going to be available in the data uh, market. And as you can see, the data provider has the responsibility of adding much more to the data asset. And so it's much more than simply the data. It's also indeed about the metadata, the access and usage policies, and so on, as you see on this slide. Uh, talking about data owners and data providers, I think it's also our word to, to zoom in on these topics, and that's what the next slide is uh, about. So um, in the next slide, we, we talk about data providers and uh, data consumers. And so uh, obviously these are the two key roles, let's say that you can identify a thing in, in many data markets. And data providers can be considered as those actors responsible for the creation and maintenance and general operation of the data products. Huh? So again, these are the, the actors let, that uh, turn, let's say a data asset into a data product. Quite often it's also uh, the data owner. It, it, it's not necessarily the case, but quite often data providers are also the owner of the data. And sometimes even um, the data provider is also the creator of the data. But of course, this is not necessary that uh, it's the same entity, let's say. Uh, as I said before, huh, data providers uh, are definitely, let's say, uh, a, a key, uh, key uh, actor in many data markets. So what are data consumers? I think this is easy. Huh? The data consumers are obviously the, the, the entities, the actors that are going to consume the data. But I think what's, what's important to, to mention still is that data providers and data consumers typically come from a different environment. And, and you might say, okay, why is this important to mention? Well, I think this is important to mention because otherwise probably there's no, uh, no sense of, of setting up a data market in the first place. So if indeed the data providers and consumers come from a different environment, it's probably more difficult, let's say, to exchange the data, to, to work together on the data, and therefore you need the data market. And of course, uh, then you can argue, okay, what does that mean a different environment? But indeed, uh, this is also good to think about because it can be difficult, difficult, uh, different sorry, locations, it can be different organizations, or it can even uh, be, let's say, uh, teams within uh, a larger company, uh, like for instance, also large international uh, automotive companies, which also typically have different departments that need to collaborate. Next slide, yes. Uh, so all of this, I think, can be used to come up with, say, a, a better definition of a data market. Uh, I'm not saying it's, it's necessarily the best uh, definition, but this is the def definition that we at least have in mind when we talk about data markets. And I think what's important about this definition is that we consider it being minimal. Huh? 
So what does that mean? Well, we say, look, a data market is a platform that provides the necessary infrastructures and services to facilitate the exchange of data products between data providers and data consumers. And we think, again, that this definition is minimal. And therefore, it, it perfectly aligns, let's say, to many different kinds of data markets. Uh, data markets within just one organization, but also data markets that are only set up for, let's say, the public well-being, nonprofit data markets, but also perhaps uh, data markets where, where, um, uh, yeah, you, you basically receive services and insight in exchange for the data. Uh, think about social media platforms. These can also be considered as some kind of data market uh, as you as a user quite often uh, uh, give a lot of data to the platform and as a result of this you you only get a service and you get insight and potentially data from other users um taking these uh, definitions uh, our research team and especially one PG student um, started uh, looking up in the literature okay what what are the current best practices let's say on on designing um, data markets huh? um, because clearly this is a, an ongoing trend and in fact if 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 you study all the the purpose that uh, that our team uh, uh, studied in, in this systematic literature review, you see that uh, there's clearly an, an, an increase in the number of publications on, on data markets. Huh? Uh, by the way, you might see that in 2020 and 2021, uh, there are slightly less papers, but this is probably, let's say, a side effect of, of the fact that these papers are not cited already a lot and therefore not not included in many search engines and therefore also not included in this uh, literature review but anyhow uh, what, what you see is that okay this is clearly an important topic as it's it's clearly uh, more and more uh, investigated and more and more studied let's say um i have to watch the time but um so let me briefly share you a few uh, uh insights that we that we gained when discussing, let's say, uh, um, these, these uh, or studying these uh, uh, papers in the literature review. Uh, okay, one of the things that we uh, studied is simply, okay, if you study all these uh, uh, papers on, on data markets, what are the typical actors? What are the typical roles that you can find in these data markets? And I think this is already very interesting because then you can easily see there are many different actors possible but they are not always present in each data market. And this is one of the things that we actually investigated. Uh, why is this the case? And what is exactly the role of these uh, roles and uh, actors? And so obviously things like a data provider, or data consumer are always in there, but this, these are not included in the slide. But here you see other roles that are present and you can easily see that one of the typical roles is for instance a data broker and this i guess makes sense because somehow you need to connect obviously the data providers to the data consumers but other roles that were uh, identified in these papers are the data transformer or the infrastructure provider and so on Next slide. Uh, okay. Additionally, what we did in this literature review is we not only focus on okay, what are now the roles, but we also focus on okay, what is the exact role of these actors, let's say, and what what do they exactly do? And this also made it possible for us to identify, let's say, the, the main problems that you have when when you set up uh, a data market. Huh? And um in general, I think we were able to identify six main problems that we found in the literature. And this is, I think, very interesting. So if you would like to set up a data market, I think these six problems are definitely problems that you need to assess. Huh? So for instance, data brokering, but also data governance. Huh? So how do you make sure that data is, is used in a, in a good way, uh, aligned to the rules that you set within your organization, for instance, but also data transformation, data uh, transaction enforcement, achieving trust, and, and last but not least, data quality assessment. And of course, given all these roles, what people typically do is they design an architecture, including roles that are going to address these uh, problems. And that's especially what you see in this, this taxonomy that, that is depicted on the slide. Additionally, what we did in the literature review is obviously we also uh, had a, a, a study or we also um, had a look into the different purpose on these different problems. 
And this made it possible to also come up with some kind of taxonomy of all the solutions that you can find in the literature. And again, this is, I think, very interesting is if you would like to design a data market yourself. And um, it's definitely not the, the, the goal of today's uh, presentation to, to give you insight in all these different solutions that you can find, but uh, at least you can see that there are many solutions uh, discussed in the literature. Huh? And, and you, I think what is also interesting is that sometimes one of the solutions that you see are actually addressing multiple problems. Huh? And, Personally, I'm, I'm definitely interested in one of the main uh, uh, components, let's say, that you find in many data markets is, is simply the, the focus on, let's say, data and metadata models. And so quite in the center of this slide, you can see that data and metadata models is considered to be a solution for, for many problems. And for instance, data brokering, data transformation, but also data quality assessment. And I think this makes sense if you think about it. Huh? If you need to transform data, it obviously is much easier if you have good data models, good meta data models. Huh? And the same is true for, for uh, controlling data quality, but also if you would like to make it easier to connect uh, the, the consumers to the right data providers, it also is much easier to query data and to compare data once you have, again, good data models. And so I think this is definitely interesting to, to study. Um, Additionally, what we did in this literature review is also based on these taxonomies of, of problems and solutions. We, we identified, let's say, five main types of data markets that you can find in the literature and probably also in, in, in practice. Uh, again, it's definitely not the goal of today's talk to, to provide you many details on how these different data markets uh, um, are developed. But uh, as you see, we have a generalist, we have a specialist data market, but also an industry data exchange data market. And they all put emphasis, let's say, on different roles that are needed. Huh? Um, as you see, we also included a couple of references of these specific uh, data markets. If you have any questions on these specific, uh, don't hesitate to ask us. I think what is definitely interesting that, uh, is, is that if you consider these different types, but also these taxonomies of, of problems and solutions, I think this definitely can lead to, to let's say, uh, development of a pattern language for data market design. And this is definitely on our research agenda, let's say to make it possible to, to come up with a pattern language, which, which is going to facilitate, let's say, the development and design of, of data markets. Um, obviously, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So what we love to do is actually uh, study how industrial data markets can actually use these patterns and these pattern languages. And, and last but not least, obviously, if, if, if people set up a data market architecture, I think what we could easily do is also evaluate, let's say, uh, how well this architecture can operate uh, based on our taxonomies of, um, of, of the problems and solutions that we identify in data market design. So there's a lot of things that uh, we plan to, to study in the future. Um, I'm not sure if there's the next slide left, Willemian. I have some final thoughts. So one of the uh, final thoughts that we uh, also concluded out of the literature study is that you see the service-oriented paradigm in the rebound. I mean, uh, those of you who have a background in service-oriented computing and service-oriented ar architectures have already noted that a lot of the concepts uh, that are now introduced in data meshes, in data marketplaces, where data products can be traded, were already initially defined in something which is called the SOC paradigm, which is graphically depicted on this uh, picture. And in fact, this is also embraced by emerging technologies and standards like the Gaia-X initiative at the European level. So indeed, we, uh, we strongly believe that this service-oriented take on data products is a very interesting uh, research topic, but likewise also a very interesting and valuable um, way to implement and realize uh, the vision of uh, data meshes and data products uh, as we uh, try to, uh, I guess, explain in today's uh, short uh, presentation. So um, there's still a very long uh, road ahead of us. And in fact, within the context of destiny, uh, we are going to collaborate with both our uh, Sapienza Italian 
and um, um, uh, Cypriotic uh, partners from the uh, Cyprus University of Technology to further, I guess, embark on this journey. And I guess with these words, I would like uh, to uh, finalize today's presentation. Thank you very much, Professor, for the very interesting presentation. Indeed, it seems that data measures and data products are the future of data handling. Uh, if, there, if anyone from the audience have any questions, can go ahead and leave them now. Um, I have one comment. Hi, William Jan. Uh, hi, Gerd. Thank you for the uh, very nice presentation. Um, of course, data meshes are somehow a continuation or an advancement from data lakes, right? So I was wondering whether uh, the same uh, problems or the same weaknesses uh, regarding the semantic annotation of the data sources that are um, ingested in a data lake or in a data mesh exist also in, in the case of the data mesh. I, I mean, if this is a, a totally new area for me, uh, I, I had the, the, the notion of data meshes uh, from Willem Jan the first time. So um, forgive me if I am a, a rookie in the area, but I would like to hear something more about uh, how you can semantically annotate something that goes in a data mesh, if there is any such thing, of course. Yeah, Andreas, thank you a lot for this question. Um, first of all, I think what we, we shouldn't forget that the, the, the data mesh is definitely, let's say, a new approach on, on how to how to share data. Huh? And, and definitely, indeed, there are some things that, that are in common with, with data lakes. Huh? I think one of the reasons uh, why data lakes are not always very successful, I think, is the fact that um, well, in the data warehouse, if you think about it, you 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 were forced to to uh, let's say um, uh, tackle uh, semantic uh, uh, gaps, let's say between different data sources, right? because this is the overall this is the goal of a data warehouse that you come up with a very clear structure on the data that can be used for for reporting and analysis purposes in the data lake. You don't do this. Huh? In fact, instead, what you do is you, you simply provide the raw data, like Lunel was saying, and then uh, yes, yeah, somehow you hope that people can, can, can use it very well. Obviously, if you do this very well, this means that you need, need to make it very easy to, to also do data transformations to, to identify semantical differences between data sources and, and so on. Um, with a data bash, I think this is also true. Eh? So um, again, we had uh, a lack of time when discussing the different uh, data market types, but um, I think one of the key things that, that you shouldn't forget indeed, and also as I said, I think uh, before is that if you have different data products, also combining these data products is only possible again if you, if you have good models. And so I'm, I'm definitely convinced that uh, ontologies and, and technologies like RDR are going to be very important in the next few years. Because at the end of the day, if, if you keep working with decentralized data projects, let's say, then the only way of combining these data products in a, in a sensible way is I think if you have indeed good data models that can be easily combined and then, then yeah, very precise and formal uh, models and uh, meta models are definitely going to be uh, very necessary. So I hope Andreas, this is uh, answering your question. Yes, yes, yeah. it actually gives me a lot of food for uh, from brainstorming. Um, I will come Hi. back to you and then Willem Jan shortly because I think some uh, new developments we have been uh, trying now to, to uh, come up with in the area of data lakes. I think this uh, can easily be transferred to the world of data measures. So um, yeah. I will keep you in the loop. Yeah, thank you a lot. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much again from, for your presentation. Our next presenter for today is Professor Clito Christodoulou from the Department of Digital Innovation of University of Nicosia. Professor, when you are ready. Hi guys, yes. Uh, 
Just share my screen. Can you can you see the presentation? Yes. Yes, we can see it. We can hear you loud and clear, Clitos. Welcome. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome to this to this presentation. Of course, it's a very different topic than the previous ones. Uh, I would like to uh, firstly thank uh, Professor Andres Andreu for this invitation. Um, in this presentation, I will I will briefly and very shortly uh, try to demystify the process of tokenization uh, with an emphasis to non fungible tokens, which are part a big part of what we refer at, as to the blockchain metaverse. Actually, uh, for those that they are not aware, um, metaverse refers to a Greek word. It has actually Greek, uh, Greek roots. And it means uh, a word for beyond, something meta as we call it. And usually when we refer to something which is um, something meta, we refer to a utopia, uh, which actually um, in our case would be a, a virtual, uh, virtual world, a, a virtual, virtual utopia. Uh, I, will, I will, of course, explain more on, with regards to this term in uh, further down the line uh, to, to the presentation. Uh, we will also be uh, discussing the process of tokenization and, uh, of course, uh, the process of tokenizing fungible, non-fungible tokens, um, which are um, built-in blocks of the um, blockchain-based metaverse. Um, a few uh, words about myself. I'm not going to get into the details. Uh, as mentioned, uh, my name is Klaus Christodoulou. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Digital Innovation at the University of Nicosia. Um, I hold a PhD in computer science, and I've been working uh, since 2013 on various topics um, uh, that relate to, to blockchain. So let's kick off the presentation with... Uh, a scene from The Matrix. I'm pretty sure that most of us know this movie. It's actually um, a series of movies. And very briefly, uh, Matrix describes a massive simulated, if you like, a virtual reality world uh, that it has been actually sustained by artificial intelligence. Um, humans that are participating uh, in this world are, are actually uh, participating as energy resources to keep up, um, you know, with their kinetic energy and thermal uh, energy that coming from their bodies, they're, they're keeping up the energy uh, for sustaining this virtual world. So the question, are we uh, heading towards a similar direction? And from what we will be discussing today, I will leave this to your own judgment. Um, so, um, through the presentation, we'll be discussing various buzzwords. Um, one of it is blockchains. So very briefly, blockchain is a decentralized infrastructure that consists of multiple peers. Potentially, those peers are unknown to each other and therefore are distributed. And they are coordinating several actions uh, between them and data based on some rules. And upon this uh, common structure that we refer as the blockchain, in the, in the literature, we'll, we'll also refer to this as, as the ledger, the centralized ledger. The rest of the terms with regards to tokenization, fungible, non-fungible tokens, and the metaverse, we will be discussing those uh, during the presentation. So uh, further expanding to the previous definition, um, blockchain is a complete and unchangeable history of blocks um, and data structure, in essence. Uh, every block of the blockchain is linked to the next block. That's why it's called a blockchain. It creates this chain of blocks. Uh, due to the fact that the blockchain is decentralized, it's particularly very uh, impossible in reality to uh, turn it off or shut it down uh, because there is not a central point of failure. And I'm talking about public blockchains here, not private ones. Uh, in general, uh, blockchain today is a is a generic technology that uh, could be applied in many different use cases. One of those use cases is the metaverse that we've been discussing today, a different la layer on the metaverse that actually supports the ownership, data ownership and data integrity, as well as auth authenticity of the data. Uh, has been characterized by the Harvard Business School as uh, the most influential, influential technology uh, for our era. 
So going back to the metrics, I will be trying to relate some of these um, actors and entities that are participating to this uh, virtual world uh, with actually some of the most significant, if you like, operations that are happening in a blockchain. So uh, the slide indicates the most significant roles and actors within this uh, virtual world. In essence, uh, this could be this is a futuristic uh, science fiction world, but uh, we could uh, easily um, uh, relate those entities in, in, in a blockchain environment. And I will explain in the next slide uh, how those uh, relate to the decision making that, that is happening to a blockchain problem. So if we relate the entities that we previously shown, um, we have the architect, the ar architect of this virtual world, which is actually uh, the word creator. And if we relate this uh, with the blockchain ecosystem, actually in a blockchain ecosystem, the, the architect is derived by the community itself. Therefore, the community drives the evolution of this uh, ecosystem itself. We have also uh, the, another entity in the matrix that um, uh, actually is um, responsible for the data governance of it. And uh, similarly to this entity, the, which is uh, represented as a program, as an algorithm, in a blockchain network, we have decentralized governance. We have alternative governance models that are governed by a consensus algorithm. And therefore, the decision making of each element within the protocol is driven by the, by the actions of the participants and also the consensus, which actually coordinates their actions. We have also the oracle, which is similar to the metrics in blockchains. Oracles allow blockchains to read data streams from external from the external world, and this data can then be uh, used to trigger several events that are happening within a blockchain uh, or guide the execution of some action, and of course. These uh, entities are uh, actually um, governed or executed with the, the use of algorithms that are embedded in, in smart contracts. And lastly, we have the blockchain protocol, which is, in essence, the underlying network of peer-to-peer -peer nodes that, uh, along with the protocol rules, are governing the network itself. So it is also the main central interface uh, that guides the evolution of the data within the network. And uh, it operates uh, with allocation of resources. And if we relate this to, <laughs> to the metrics, obviously we are not using any human brain or any <laughs> uh, human body energy to do that. It's just resources that are allocated to the network. Um, all I'm saying is that we are still far from having this fully AI operated kind of metaverse. Uh, However, uh, we, there are some uh, building blocks that we'll be discussing today uh, that emerge from blockchains on how uh, um, we are heading towards uh, a utopia, a virtual world implementation. So what can blockchains offer to virtual worlds? Actually, blockchains can offer an infrastructure that is ubiquitous and persistent, and it can be used to enable um, digital ownership, digital authenticity, digital identity, then digital integrity of the data, and of course, the digital transfer transferability of all the objects, uh, digital representation of objects that are sustained within a blockchain environment. And this was something that is, it was missing from existing um, virtual environments, I mean, this layer that uh, blockchain contributes to. So we're gradually building our story towards the, this idea of a metaverse. And uh, of course, we, we need to describe the building blocks. And we have actually two main categories of digital representation of items uh, in blockchains and a process that is being used for creating those digital representations, a process called tokenization. And um, in essence, this is uh, a process of converting 
value that is stored in a tangible or an intangible object into a token that it could be represented or manipulated over a blockchain system. In simple words, as also written in this slide, tokenization can happen uh, on any asset, on any real or virtual asset. And um, through blockchains, we could enable the digital transfer ownership and storage of those assets without the need of any central third party or intermediary. And actually we have two categories. We have the fungible tokens and the non-fungible tokens. Similarly to the real world, we have uh, you know, um, the tokens that are fun fungible, um, which as we mentioned, um, those tokens could be um, interchanged it could also be interchanged with the same kind of token or uh, with any other type of token. Uh, for example, in the real world, if we consider a, a 50 euro note, we can interchange it with the same um, 50 euro note. Similarly, uh, in the blockchain world, one Bitcoin could also be exchanged with another Bitcoin, which it doesn't make any difference to the holder. In essence, um, compared with um, you know, non-fungible tokens that are non-interchangeable, meaning that those type of tokens are unique, um, they are not actually interchangeable as they cannot be replaced with a non-fungible token of the same type because of their uniqueness and their unique attributes. Um, from the other hand, if we compare fungible and non-fungible tokens again, Fungible tokens are divisible, um, which means that we can divide them into smaller units. Um, Non-fungible tokens are not divisible. Uh, this token cannot, these tokens cannot be divided. However, we are looking uh, on several new standards that are upcoming within the blockchain ecosystem that will allow us to uh, fragmentize those tokens into smaller pieces. So, this process of tokenization consists of, you know, uh, in reality, creating some computer code and generating some computer code uh, that it will enable us to uh, represent the key characteristics of those assets uh, while exposing some functions that will allow the user to interact with those um, digital representations. For example, if we take the example of Ethereum blockchain, this, this computer uh, code, is represented by a smart contract that is written on Solidity, which is a high level programming language similar to JavaScript. So in the next few slides, I'm sharing very briefly the process of tokenization. We are envisioning this process of actually um, grouped into four steps. The first step of tokenizing an asset is to create the model which means that we will uh, be using some set of standards uh, for representing um, the attributes of this digital item and also the functionality of those digital item. Um, there are several standards that are out there that uh, are considered today. Some of the most popular ones exist in the Ethereum blockchain and is the ERC20 and the ERC721 standard for non-fungible tokens and fungible tokens. Then once we decide on which standard we would like to use, depending on the type of token that we will be uh, generating, the next step is to model the asset. This means that we will need to uh, answer several questions of this representation, including the question on, um, on ownership, the question of any regulatory restrictions or data privacy, um, and also what are the properties that we would like to capture for those um, digital representations of an assets, of, of those of those assets. And once we uh, complete this modeling stage, then the next step is to, uh, uh, of course, um, create the smart contracts and audit those smart contracts. Uh, since um, we, we, we do not uh, need to forget that uh, 
it's very essential to consider in a decentralized environment that once we deploy the code, we cannot change it, we cannot edit it. So this step is very essential in order to make sure that we do not have any smart contracts that are driven with bugs, et cetera. Therefore, uh, in this step, we're actually mostly concerned with testing the code against any potential vulnerabilities. Once we do that, the last um, step is the step of deployment, actually deploying the smart contract that will enable the representation of those assets to the blockchain network um, into a mainnet. Um, so this is the, the process of uh, deploying um, the actual uh, um, uh, digital representation or, and the smart contract governance of those digital representations to the actual network. So it's similar of having, let's say, a computer program uh, written in some uh, other high-level uh, programming language, and we uh, create the executable uh, file of, 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 of it, of the code. But in this case, we, we create the executable bytecode on a blockchain environment. Uh, in this slide, I'm showing an example of, uh, of um, a meme, which is uh, representing one of the popular memes created back in 2011, indicating how uh, digital representations on the blockchain could be implemented with the use of non-fungible tokens. Um, although this is um, one of the many examples uh, of uh, showing how um, art could be represented as an NFT, it inspired various online creators across the globe in order to make several further other memes and minting them as NFTs in a blockchain environment. And just for the record, uh, this particular meme was sold for 600K US dollars. In any case, um, as already mentioned, blockchains offer an infrastructure that is ubiquitous and persistent, and it could be uh, enable this process of tokenization, which is very essential for building the building blocks for the next evolution of blockchain based. So, um, just to give you an idea of how this space is emerging at the moment, um, the NFT sales in 2020, the first uh, half of the year, were very minimum. Um, towards this, the, the, the first half of 2021, they've reached to uh, a market cap of $2.5 billion. And on the second half, which I'm not showing this in this graph, they've reached uh, around 22 billion, which shows exactly how people are moving to diversify their investments uh, with the use of uh, NFTs. Uh, at the moment, we are uh, in a cycle of uh, people uh, trading their NFTs as collectibles, uh, collectible art, etc. We have also been um, experiencing the first, uh, if you like, evolution of metaverses, virtual worlds that are out there. More examples uh, um, are shown in this slide. Uh, several NFTs are sold as collectible JPEGs, etc. And um, in the virtual worlds, we've seen traders investing in virtual lands in various virtual environments. Uh, and indeed, uh, you can check out those uh, virtual worlds. Um, most popular ones are um, Decentraland, Decentraland and in the sandbox. And we've seen many um, enterprises moving actually their operations in these virtual environments as well. It seems that NFTs are here to stay and the NFTs, they provide a different way of expression for several people. One way of expressing is uh, expressing personalizations in this world is with the use of avatars. In the slide, I'm showing one of the most popular collections of NFTs that have been minted in the space uh, by a company called Larva Labs. And this is the project called a CryptoPunk project, which indicates these avatars uh, profile pictures that are minted as NFTs using the ERC721 standard on the Ethereum blockchain. And actually, if you check out this uh, collection uh, yourself, you will notice that uh, those avatars are quite popular and therefore they are driven by a high uh, pricing at the moment between uh, people that are collecting those um, avatars and, and art. 
So in reality, NFTs will be representing an extension of the physical uh, representation of objects. And if we consider the vision of the spatial web, uh, we are looking into a web evolution where the physical layer is kind of evolved with the use of an overlay layer that represent those objects as digital twins uh, to some kind of a metaverse environment. So um, that's all for today, guys. Uh, any any questions? Um, I have some questions. Yes. Uh, my first is not a question, it's more like a clarification. Mm -hmm. uh, NFTs on marketplaces are created each from a specific smart contract yes. that specifies uh, the attributes of the NFT. Am I right? So in a marketplace, they are created within the marketplace uh, generic uh, smart contract. But yes, there are marketplaces that you can create your own smart contract that uh, encapsulates or wraps a specific collection. Okay. Each item within the collection is um, connected with a JSON file, which is actually uh, representing the attributes uh, of that um, item. Yes, but uh, because I played a little bit with NFTs, mm -hmm. uh, when you try to get the JSON file from a marketplace, let's say OpenSea, uh, some NFTs has have different JSON format from the other. Yes, That's because the ERC721 uh, standard indicates the minimum set of attributes that are, uh, you know, uh, recommended for use, but they are, but it depends on the um on the creator of each item on which attributes um to include in the set of attributes mm -hmm. so there is not a, a standard standardized schema that uh, enforce enforces the you know um these um, annotations uh, over each item okay uh, same goes for the image some nfts had a, a URL for a PNG made, and some others had a bitmap. Yes, uh, yes, this depends again on the representation of the digital object. As you will see, most of the cases in OpenSea, um, some of the items could also remain in the, in the Amazon Web uh, Cloud. Others are using the peer-to-peer -peer storage IPFS uh, or similar services that are using IPFS as the storage of those items. And again, it, it depends on the representation of, uh, of those digital items. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter for IPFS to push, for example, in bitmap or um, uh, just the um, base 64 representation of, uh, of the digital item. It's just that. OK, thank yeah. you. Uh, <laughs> uh, what determines the price of an NFT? Why do they gain, why do they gain value? As, as with all. As with all uh, things in the physical world as well, this de de depends on uh, supply and demand. Uh, nowadays, we have a lot of people that are coming from the physical world, uh, you know, collectors that they, they see also uh, those items as investment of opportunities. We also have a lot of uh, micro uh, investments that are happening from digital natives and the new generation of uh, people that are using, you know, um, this um, digital representation has investment opportunities, investment vehicles, and therefore all is driven by, you know, how how much do you believe on those items, and how um, I mean, and how markets are reacting to uh, to the supply and demand. So, as with all things, I mean. Even money is a human-made artifact. I mean, who drives the the value or the exchange rate of uh, of a currency? The the need of using and the utility of it. So, same network effects are happening in this space as well, or similar. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Klidos. It was very you, interesting uh, as always your presentation. Um, before closing your uh, your talk, um, what would you what your advice would be for young people that see all this hype, all this easy money, all this um, 
opportunities for uh, for quick, uh, let's say, uh, wealth. Uh, I mean, uh, there are a lot of obstacles, a lot of uh, catches, a lot of uh, there's danger, losing money, and so on. Therefore, what you are advised would be to those young graduates, for example, of computer science departments that wish to uh, be involved with this industry, not from the point of view of the developer, but also from the point of view of the of the player. You know what I mean? Yes. Uh, thank you, Andrea. That's a, a question that I get a lot. Uh, before answering the question, I just wanted to say, just for the record, that we should not be um, uh, forgetting the big picture here. Um, blockchains find utility in many use cases. And since we are uh, experiencing a paradigm shift where the web itself is transforming into a decentralized layer of digital ownership, pushing data closer to the user and giving back the uh, if you like the ownership and also the, the freedom to the user without using any third party uh, to you know, own its own data, et cetera. I think the big picture here is that we are experimenting with, with a technology that could um, decouple uh, many operations from big technology companies uh, that are actually using the data for their, their own purposes. And therefore, we are currently experiencing this paradigm shift to the web evolution. That's one thing. Now, in terms of investments, um, the short answer is do your own research. As with all investment vehicles, there are certain risks that you should consider. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I think this, this is my advice. I mean, do not, uh, you know, um get um you know over um and enthusiastic about the about the hype but do your own research before investing anything in in this world uh, also in the physical world it's, it's the same thing okay thank you Glidos. anyone uh, would like to place a question a comment something no Okay, thank you once again, Klidos. Thank you very much. For the uh, so I think we are now at the end of the final day of the school. Uh, we can conclude uh, five days of uh, very productive and uh, fruitful presentations. Um, uh, yes. have one more presentation. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, what is the next presentation? Is by Dr. Konstantinos Panayotou from Excelsior. He's a ah. researcher at the Radosenis Center of Excellence. My Excelers. apologies, Konstantinos. Yes, sorry for that. You have the floor. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to participate to this interesting uh, discussion. Uh, so, a moment to make to share my screen. Uh, Okay, so I guess you can hear me clearly, right? Yes. Yes, loud and clear. Thank you very much. So uh, today I would like to present you uh, part of our research activities uh, within a water JPI project uh, that we're running together with some collaborators from Brazil, Germany, and France. And um, so we're going to talk about smart systems. Uh, actually, the name of the project is called Smart Control, uh, which basically related with a smart framework uh, in which uh, we're using real-time monitoring. So basically what we're doing, uh, we're installing uh, at specific locations uh, um, uh, in, in different areas of the world and to measure the quality of the groundwater. And this information is transferred uh, through some online servers. 
uh, to a web-based platform that we will explain uh, during the discussion. Uh, and with this information, we can do a lot of things to assess uh, the state of the groundwater systems, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, <clears throat> um, as a first, um, why is that? Try to check that. So, as a first slide, uh, what I would like to show you is basically the general scope of the project. So the general scope is actually applicable not only for cases where we consider the, the let's say the groundwater uh, systems, but it can be applied to almost everything that we have also discussed before. So, and everything starts from our need to make uh, good decisions. We want to make uh, smart decisions, which will be beneficial for ourselves, for the environment, and in order to do that, we need data. We need a lot of data, relevant data. And to do that, we need to obtain data from many different sources. So this data, uh, depending on the problem that you have to, uh, to consider, uh, they can be detailed enough to be representative of the scale of the system that you are considering. Uh, so it's always good to have a wide range of scales to consider and data that are able to make a sufficient re a resolution of these uh, of the scales. Uh, but because we are also considering in real life complex systems, it's also good to have different sources and so considering different characteristics of these systems. And the idea is that we can use some tools. Uh, which we can integrate this data together. We can transform this data through different kinds of models, might be numerical models, might be uh, analytical models, might be any kind of model that suits us. And through this combination, of course, what we want to obtain at the end is basically a more wisdom uh, and realization of what go, what, what's going on with the system. And this is what we call the knowledge. Uh, so the better understanding of the system. And through this process and having the proper knowledge, reliable as much as possible knowledge, we can then use this to design or revise better strategies, to make better decisions, to recommend to the policymakers uh, some additional tools, et cetera, et cetera, to improve the management of the authorities on the specific uh, subject. In our case, um, we have considered the groundwater systems, which we have a lot here in Cyprus, because as we all know here in Cyprus, it's one of the hot topics to encounter not only now, but also for the next years. And as I said at the beginning of this, let's say circle, uh, we want to consider both the benefits on ourselves, but also on the environment to let's say assure us at least mitigate the adverse effects of it. So <clears throat> the first slide is just uh, regarding the needs is basically uh, the need to use environmentally sustainable technologies uh, to address these issues. And so this is also, as we know, uh, direction of the uh, European Union uh, towards the clean energy and also applying environmentally sustainable technologies. So the causes behind this adversity on this subject uh, can be, let's say, uh, located at the, at the combined action of, uh, of, let's say, the urban urbanization of the areas to the extreme climate changes, to the growth of the population, uh, which resulted to many different uh, other situations, as you can see at the bottom part of the slides. Uh, so these are also problems that we're encountering in Cyprus too, uh, which is uh, located in one of the more vulnerable areas in the world in terms of the climate changes and the water scarcity. Actually Cyprus, as I checked a few days ago, has one of the lowest, if not the lowest, or the highest, let's say, if it, since it's a negative index of the water exploitation index. So 
it's basically an index that tells you that it's comparing basically the amount of water that you have available in order to, to use to, for any kind of applications uh, compared to the, the exploitation of this amount of water. So what it says basically is that Cyprus is using a lot of amount of, the, of its water resources. So we need to be very careful with that. And so the, based on that, uh, <laughs> different techniques have been applied. Uh, so one elegant option is basically to use uh, what's called the managed aquifer recharge. So in simple words, what is managed aquifer recharge? Basically, let's say what we have in Ezusa in Paphos. So we're gathering water, we're gathering wastewater. So from the urban area, so water that, that we don't need from our houses. This water is collected to the wastewater plant stations, Sala, Saba, for example. And they are, this water is subjected to, let's say, treatment processes. So they are trying to clean it, let's say, from the solids and to reduce the pathogenic organics, let's say, the harmful organics that are within this water, and then use this water for different applications uh, in, in Esos and Bafos and in Limassol, in Akrodiri. 70 almost percent of this, let's say, treated water is used for agricultural purposes. And around 25 to 30% is used for tourings or any other kind of activities, mostly to the tourist uh, sector. So by, let's say, taking water from different sources like the wastewater plant station and through pipelines to, uh, to deliberately infiltrating the groundwater. So this is how basically why we call it the managed aquifer recharge, because we are doing it by ourselves and our, in our attempt to recharge, to add water within the groundwater systems, which are called aquifers, okay? So aquifer is basically an, a groundwater system that is having the ability to store, it, to, to store water, okay? And this is done because it, it can be applied uh, for many reasons. One reason is because, as we all know, because of the high temperatures in Cyprus, we have very high evapotranspiration rates along the dams. So a lot of water is basically evaporated and we cannot use it for uh, other purposes. Uh, it can be also used to, let's say, compensate between the, let's say, the need of the seawater to penetrate uh, below the, the coast and that way to, let's say, pollute the groundwater resources in the island. Actually, it's a, it's a it's a, pro, it's a it's, let's say, a hazard that in Cyprus we are taking a lot of consideration, especially in the coastal areas. And of course, it can be used, uh, let's say, to even, to help us on cleaning the water, because when you have this, let's say, wastewater moving towards the, uh, the groundwater, it passes through the soil layers and interacts with the soil layers. And through this interaction, uh, some amount let's say some pollutants of this water that is carrying with it while it's moving downwards, it's actually captured by the soil and it's acting like a filter. So these are some benefits that we're having when we are using this kind of techniques. And this is the reason, at least I try to, to, to justify why this is an important issue for us in Cyprus. And why we want to apply smart systems to these applications for our own benefit. So the current studies, not just in Cyprus, but in general, is that specifically for the groundwater applications, uh, there are, they are, let's say, some limited efforts up to this point to have some web-based interactions, interaction platforms. So what is mostly done is let's say to create some numerical models, let's say a model that simulates what's going on at the subsurface in the aquifer, and afterwards upload this model, okay? So we upload this model to a platform, so a ready model, and we just change the inputs basically, okay? So it's something like a fixed situation where you cannot do a lot of things, but, this has many limitations. One limitation, for example, is that if you are having something developing your desktop, 
you probably need to reinstall some packages. You will need some additional maintenance uh, activities. You might have the problem of transferring your results to others, okay, to some others who might want to check your models to validate your results and use them for their own purposes. So this is a problem identified by a research group in Technological University of Dresden, with whom we interact a lot uh, through this project. And their idea was very simple. It was on the one hand, to give you the ability to develop a model, so the setup, run the model, and interpret your results completely online. And at the same time, connect these models with different kinds of sources. So you could use online data, you could use data as Excel, and of course it can be connected with some in situ observation systems, which were already also developed here in Cyprus. So you can actually take information directly uh, from the wells that we have installed them in the wells, information about the quality of the water, and this information is transferred to a server in, in a company uh, in Germany. And from there is giving information to the platform and the university from where we can create our models and use this information uh, for further uses as I will show. So what we show here basically at this slide is basically six different areas around the world. So six different groundwater systems of different scales of different complexity. So this one here is basically the one we are having in Paphos. Paphos there is a big aquifer uh, where we want to monitor uh, the quality of the water there. So what we're doing is basically we are combining information from sensors we have installed in different wells. Okay, this information is, can be processed also uh, at the platform and visualized before using it and imported to different kinds of web-based tools. So the web-based tools are basically the applications of this, of this data. So we can use this information to make some risk assessment um, of different hazards depending on the source quality. Uh, we can also use this information, uh, let's say to inform the local authorities uh, and to say that if this amount, if this amount of concentration is above a threshold, then we have a problem and then they might take some preventing measures. We can run some simulations and use these information to update the model. So let's say we want to run for tomorrow a simulation based on real data. So what we do basically, we set up the this, this smart system in situ to send information every day about the water levels. So how high and low is basically the level of the water within the groundwater system, how much is the temperature, how much is the salinity to see if there's any seawater intrusion, for example, etc. And through this, we can, let's say, have real, almost real time because you are ne never having real time, it won't be uh, specific. And then use this information to make also forecasting. So make some predictions. So we are using, let's say, scenario analysis. So <clears throat> this is just uh, a flow chart which shows you basically that we can use the, the real-time monitoring data obtained from the in situ observation systems. We can load them in a model that we have already developed, which is, let's say, calibrated in terms of the case that we are considering. And then we can actually you know, um, um, design the system. So every day, for example, or every hour or even every second, but, but in our case, every second doesn't make sense because of the scaling of the problem to send new data and rerun the problem and get the updated values for the water levels, for example. So here I'm just going to briefly show you some uh, tools we are using. So this is some pictures I took uh, from the ESUS area. So here you can see the system. So this is external antenna. So this, let's say the data logger. So we are having, so what you see here is basically a well. We put the system protected by a box and <clears throat> we have a cable which enters the water. And then there we have, uh, let's say our sensor which is taking information for the temperature of the water, for the salinity of the water, and for the water table, okay? So this information 
is sent to the platform. This is just a screenshot of the setup of the sensors in the platform. So here is basically you see Paphos area, here urban area Hiroshibu. Here we have five installed systems. And from there, you can see some time trace that I'm showing uh, for, um, for different uh, uh, periods. And uh, we can combine this information, not only with this on uh, in situ data, but also from CMV data, because uh, <clears throat> we want to combine this information with historical data. So data before the installation of the systems. And so this information, and as, as I said before, can be used for different application. One interesting application we are using is what is called the 50 days rule. Basically in Germany, but also in Cyprus, although not so far, not so known in Cyprus. If you enter, let's say, if you infiltrate water within the groundwater system, uh, you need to let it, let's say, develop for 50 days until you, let's say, it's, let's say it's safe for this water to take it out and use it for agriculture, for example, purposes. And so what we have seen is that if we have, let's say, a system at the well that we are, let's say, recharging, throwing inside the water, and let's say a well a little bit farther away from where we're going to extract the water, we can see that there is, let's say, some kind of correlation between the temperature of the, this water, which also it's it's reasonable if you think of it because of the you know of the of the change of the day, right? Because we have the morning. You have the peak of the temperature during noon and afterwards it goes down. So through these different uh, trigonometrical trigonometric profiles, we're trying to find a correlation and connect the one well with the other. Of course, this is a simplified approach, but we can take information about how many days the specific, let's say, fluid particles uh, move until we obtain them from the, from the, the let's say, another uh, well. So this is just uh, a tool for that purpose. Uh, we have other uh, tools at the web, uh, which we're considering the concentration of pathogenic organisms, so vir virus, protozoa, uh, bacteria. In Cyprus, we're considering mostly bacteria, but in other countries are also monitoring the other also type of pathogenic organisms. So for now, this is not so relevant for Cyprus because we don't have actual data from the authorities, just few data four months, every four months for some for a bacterium. But still, this is a useful tool to make some, let's say, stochastic estimations and can be used as a supplementary basically tool for the authorities when they have actual data for this. So what we have done, we have gathered literature data and we have used the platform uh, to, to, let's say, create some probabilities, illness uh, and infection probabilities, and use this to see what are the dangers here in Cyprus uh, based on some similar, let's say, uh, situations in other countries. So we're making an analogies uh, from other countries with similar treatment processes from the wastewater plant station, similar climate uh, conditions, uh, similar agricultural activities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and this is basically how it looks if you go in the platform. So, at the right side, basically, what you can see, you can see the menu bar here. Here, you can consider different treatment processes for those who are involved in the chemical engineering regime. They can see that in Cyprus, we have tertiary treatment. So, within the wastewater plant station. And this was an additional treatment process, what I told you before with the filtering um, of the water while it infiltrates through the soil. So we're basically importing data depending on the literature values or the actual data that we're having in case we're having measurements from the field. So another application we're having is basically what is called the real-time monitoring tool. Uh, where you, you, you can simply see, for example, the evolution of different water parameters. So here is a screenshot from our partners in Germany. So they have only one sensor here. And what you see here at the right side is the time evolution of the quantity that they want to consider. In their case, they're considering the water levels. And so for example, you can go here anytime you want 
It's anyway a public uh, platform. Anyone can register there and you can go there in a daily base and see what is the value. And if this value is below or above the threshold, uh, currently we are trying actually to connect this platform with other uh, options like sending you on the uh, on your phone an alert message. I know that it's already done in other cases. So the problem is not with the technologies that we're developing the platform and we're in the process of adding additional and additional uh, uh, functionalities on it. <clears throat> this is an example of how, how, can, uh, how can we set up a groundwater model. So basically what we show here is that you can choose an area. So we are having a map. You are having an area where you, are, you want to consider the, the groundwater uh, conditions. And then you create a model. So you are taking basically from the Google Earth or from any kind of other um, uh, sources you are having. And you are trying to model the area. Then you are separating the area. You are basically decomposing the area into different, let's say, cells. Uh, and at every cell, so what is called discretization. And then what you are doing, you are solving some equations, characteristic of the problem. Uh, you are applying some boundary conditions. If you have the monitoring data or other kind of data, you are using them to calibrate the model so that is representative, the results are representative of the problem that you are considering. So these are just different packages that uh, we are using. And let's say this is a screenshot of the results. So basically what you see here is basically some, the different colors are basically uh, can be related basically with the water levels. So how high and how low is the water uh, at the groundwater system? Okay, and then here what we see is basically some cross section, horizontal and vertical. So we can move along the horizontal section and see what is the variation of the water table and along the vertical, of course. And so we have different kind of uh, visualization tools here. We can check the water budget, if the system is sustainable or not, if more water is leaving or entering the system compared to the opposite one, et cetera, et cetera. So here are just some details of the numerical models. Maybe it's not relevant for you. Just to show you the, the different options that we are having here, we can run cases where we're considering a steady, a steady condition of the groundwater system. A case, for example, that the, the, the water tables are changing very slowly or cases where it's not changing very slowly. Uh, <clears throat> we can check the results of, of the model compared to some actual observations. So we're basically checking if the results are okay or not to validate what we're doing. Um, and in addition, in addition to that, if we want to examine, uh, let's say, uh, future scenarios, we can go, for example, and say, okay, we have this amount of water that is coming from the wastewater plant station or from the dams, but we have information from the wastewater plant station that this amount of water that is provided might be increased by 10% during the next five, five years. And actually, this is a realistic scenario for Cyprus. Uh, for example, in, in Pafon, in Sapa, uh, currently they are using 12,000 of uh, cubic meters per day. Uh, but uh, because the capacity of the station is around 19.5,000 cubic meters per day, uh, they, are, they want to increase the amount of water that, they are, that is, let's say, available uh, for, or for you know, infiltrating to the, to the groundwater system. So we collaborate with them and we're considering different scenarios. We are increasing the amount of water that is infiltrating. And uh, we're trying to see how the groundwater system will respond in terms of water quality. So this is a very useful tool for comparison purposes because you can actually run the actual case for now. You can compare it with the future case. You can play with the different amount of waters to see if there is a more increase or less how this will influence the water table, et cetera, et cetera. And this is just a general flow chart. From this, uh, I mean, I, it's basically what I have already said. You create a model online. Everything is happening online, OK? You are building the model. Then you are adjusting some model parameters so that they represent the actual case based on real data from the field. Then 
you are basically updating your boundary conditions based on either existing historical data or on real time monitoring data that are gaining in a database from the smart system that is installed in the, in the ground. And then you're updating your results and see what's going on. So basically here is just a, a time phrase showing some real data, uh, basically real data, what I mean, real time data. So this vertical line is basically separating the data obtained from the, from the sensor. And on the left side, what we see basically are historical delta. And this is just an overview of the different models or the different tools that we can use. We don't really care to, to put more discussion on that. So this, I'm just show, going to show you some applications uh, for ESOSA case. So what I show here is basically the application of the scope of the project. Uh, in the case where we're, we care about the sustainability of the groundwater system um, in terms of the water availability. So the idea is that uh, if, if the system is considered sustainable, it's not just a matter of the amount of water you are having on it, but also on the, on the quality of this water. So in our case, at the current stage of the platform that we are developing, uh, we have considered uh, the water amounts. So the data we are using has basically hydrogeological properties. So we want to take information about the properties of the soil how fast the water is moving, how low, how slowly, how, how is it storage water or not. So this is what we call hydrogeological properties. We want also information about the rainfall because the, this amount of water is also entering the system, uh, about transpiration data from different meteorological stations, et cetera, et cetera. We are using this information inside some equations that we are solving which will have as output the evolution of the water table. And this water table is actually given to the authorities uh, for their own purposes to see if they have to change something on the amount of water that they are recharging their systems, or if some periods of the year they might be more careful, et cetera, et cetera. What we show here is basically a screenshot from the, from the, from the uh, website. So these are the different areas, the different colors are basically referring to different hydrogeological properties. Uh, what we show here are basically the calibration of the model. So this line here is basically a, a regression line. So the vertical axis, basically what we found through simulations and the horizontal is what is actually observed. So we see that the calibration has a very high R square value, which means that the results are reasonable. And uh, then we went to another period of time and uh, to check the validity of, of our results. We have seen that again, we have high R square values. So let's say our model is uh, reasonably, um, let's say correct to use for our purposes. Uh, so after that, we have considered different scenarios as I told you before, in this case, uh, we are having us based some actual result, uh, actual data, but since we are doing a forecasting, uh, we are adapting this uh, data um, so that they are representative of some future scenarios. That's why we call them expected conditions, for example. We are running a number of simulations, again, through the same numerical models, and we are doing such outputs, let's say not this time a value at every location of the water table, of the water levels, but let's say a distribution, which can be used, uh, let's say, to the can be used by the authorities uh, to if they find it necessary to revise their strategies. So <clears throat> we have also done that. We have provided these results to the authorities. We're actually now in discussions with them um, to 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 consider additional scenarios. Uh, here I'm just showing some results, which um, I don't think it's necessary to to elaborate them um, a lot. Just here, what I want to, you to see in this oval is basically different scenarios. This scenario with there, this is the head values, the water levels. This is zero, basically is the sea level. And what we see here for one scenario that we have some negative values for a small period of time. This period of time occurred during the summer of 2015. And 
when we showed these results to the authorities, they mentioned that this was a period where we had dropped, uh, uh, it was an extended drop period where we didn't have a lot of rain and we had problems with the amount of water in the dams. And uh, so this actually representing the, the, uh, the, the situation that took place uh, at that period of time. So we're trying to, let's say, validate what we are having the simulations with the actual cases. Um, so here I'm just showing um, some visualization tools of the, of the, <clears throat> of the web-based platform. Uh, basically for the period where we had the problem uh, that I showed you before, we went there and we check if this is related with seawater intrusion. So basically this here is the sea. Here is the well, the location where we had the, let's say the negative uh, water level. And what we wanted to see is basically if this is a local situation or this is related with seawater intrusion. So what we see here, basically what we see here, this sudden drop of the water level happens only at the area of the well where we're taking the water out, but it's it's not only a counter in area in other areas closer to the coast. So basically this reduction of the water was related basically with the, let's say with the over exploitation of the water at the area here. But unfortunately it didn't result to the, to the seawater intrusion. So water moving towards this area. For this to happen, we should have seen also negative values to these areas here. So see values of the head below zero. So if, so for example, here is a coast. So we move al along this area. So if these values here until this here were let's say below zero, then combined with what we got here, this would be an indication that we have seawater intrusion during that period. So you, you can see how we can relate the simulations uh, with, the, with the real life. So this is another application, which I already discussed before about the, the, the risk associated with the, let's say the pathogenic uh, organism, the viruses, the bacteria, etc. Uh, this is just a screenshot again from the, uh, from the web-based platform. This is the website from where we have, in, we have used from our partner in KWB in Berlin to, let's say, to install their software in the platform for use. And this is just uh, screenshots from the platform, how you can enter the data. And this is just some results. We don't need to elaborate. This is an interesting part, I think, because um, we, what, what we were able to do uh, was to see in case we have some uh, hazards, some risk associated with the water quality uh, after the treatment from the wastewater plant station, what should be, let's say, the filtering uh, of, the, of the soil, of the system, the groundwater system, so that zero risk were associated with this wastewater. And we have found some values in general uh, of the filtering. So basically, we can use this kind of uh, tools in order to see if the filtering is sufficient or not uh, for our purposes. Um, which can be also used by the authorities. And uh, okay, this one is basically what I have shown you before. Uh, a, a last application that we have um, uh, implemented in the platform is basically related with cost benefit analysis. So basically uh, <clears throat> we collaborate with some colleagues from BRGM, from the Geological Survey of France. Uh, we have provided a mostly not, um, let's say, um, uh, online data uh, for them to see how is the situation now with the water allocation in Cyprus. And we want them to make a cost benefit analysis on the current status in Cyprus, and then provide them additional information for the salinity of the water, from the quality of the water from the, from the smart systems, and see if they can, let's say, pro propose a revised strategy that can, let's say, be more beneficial uh, for the farmers and for the local stakeholders, for the, basically for the water development department. Here I'm just showing some dissemination activities in order for all of these to be meaningful and, and theoretical stuff. We, we promote the awareness of the, 
of the relevant stakeholders. For example, we have close collaboration with different farmer unions. Uh, we interact also with the research uh, centers in Cyprus and discuss with them our problems, their needs, and adapt as much as we can the tools that we implement based on their needs. Uh, we have also tried to uh, reach uh, mass media coverage and interact with the most relevant stakeholders like the Water Development Department in Papos, with whom we have a close collaboration. We have conducted some surveys with uh, local stakeholders, stakeholders from the Geological Survey, from the Water Development Department, from other research institutes, from farmers to see if this is of interest of them, how much knowledge they have, what are the tools they care about. For example, here, they care a lot about the real-time monitoring with online sensors, being able to have access to this data, learn a little bit about uh, developing and using groundwater models to do their own simulations. We have also this ability, so you can actually use these models and maybe you can just import the data you consider, new boundary conditions, new basically Excel files, et cetera, et cetera. So we created, uh, <clears throat> we have basically created some other activities called replication activities to see if we can transfer the, this uh, concept to other cases, not only in Cyprus, but in general. In Cyprus, we have identified another system another MARS system, managed aquifer recharge system in Akrodiri, uh, where they face similar problems, similar ch challenges. It's an area where the next years they will have uh, uh, a development, a touristic development, and they want to see how this might influence the sustainability of the groundwater system. We have also have a lot of dissemination activities in different international activities. We have tried to talk about our concept to real people, but in some cases not to so real people. I don't know if they understand what we are talking about, that they, they were looking happy and interesting to. And not only that, apart from the submission to journals, we are we are now developing a collaboration with some students, master students from Brazil, Guatemala, and Holland, um, a game in which they can use for educational purpose. Uh, let's say we have simplified models for Ezusa for uh, for other uh, <clears throat> systems, and they can see how this, the the groundwater system responds. Um, so this is just a photo. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, in case you have any kind of uh, uh, interest in that questions, I will happy to discuss with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Constantinos, for your presentation. Any questions from the audience? Okay, it looks like we don't have any questions. Thank you very much again. Uh, by closing with your presentation, which it was the last presentation of the school, actually, uh, we are closing the second school of destiny. Thank you all attendees and presenters for being here with us. It was a very inspiring and productive week. See you next time. Thank you very much and bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye.